Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Mr. Turner, you have the honors. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, will you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, we are reminded of your audacious commandment that we are to love our enemies. And we ask that we remember that we in a community, as we approach this budget season, are not enemies, but we are community members and neighbors with differing views. And we pray that everyone will honor others' views and create a process where we can work together to solve the issues of the day. We also pray for continued improvement of Brother Lashley and that you will bring, back him, bring him back to, to the next meeting so that he may participate in his duty. In your name we pray. Amen. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I ask for a motion as to the agenda, um, I have some really, really positive news. Um, Bill Lashley called me on his cell phone on the way home for the hospital today. So, that proves one thing, prayers are answered. Okay, do we have a motion as to the agenda? So move. I'll suck it. Uh, would, would the chair consider an amendment to the motion? I, I, I would like to amend the, uh, the agenda to add an item of a, a discussion, which is the Cummings High School bleachers. Okay. I would certainly, the bleachers themselves at Cummings. The bleachers, the football bleachers. Right. at Cummings and uh, potential funding for a potential fix. If that's your motion, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Any board, any problem, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Where do you want to park it? Why don't we, uh, that's hopefully going to be short. <laughs> uh, why don't we put that in front of uh, 7A, first item of business. Is that agreeable? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of the approving the agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Okay. We have two proclamations. So I'm going to ask uh, Ray Vipperman and who else is Ray? Who did you bring? Who are the guilty parties? <laughs> Got some staff here with us tonight. <laughs> Evening. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, board, we have a proclamation which you have read in our preparation for this meeting. Do we have a motion to approve this proclamation for Emergency Medical Services Week? I'll move. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Ms. Thompson made the motion and Mr. Carter did second. the second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. This is the proclamation and we are thanking each and every one of you guys. So, by the way, I have three daughters and a wife of over 50 years uh, and I call everybody guys. I don't care. <laughs> okay. This proclamation reads, Emergency Medical Services Week is May 19th through the 25th of 2024, whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service, and we all know that, whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care uh, to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury, and whereas emergency medical services has grown to fill a gap provided, uh, providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative uh, medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine. And whereas the emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, Therefore, Terry, join us. Please. Stand up for the group. Terry. And we'll have them join as well. Uh, they're going to get a bigger stand up. Educators, administrators, pre hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public and other out-of-hospital medical provider, <coughs> providers, whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their uh, life-saving skills, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value of your accomplishments of emergency medical services provided by designating the Emergency Medical Services Week and whereas the 50th anniversary of EMS theme is EMS Week, honoring our past, forging our future, we encourage the community to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby recognize the week of May 19 through 25, 2024, as the medical as the Emergency Medical Services Week in Alamance County. And I want to say thank you. And we all do. <laughs> Ray, if you can have the other parties stand up with us. Chiefs, all three, all three chiefs. Okay, you're part of this group. <laughs> okay, uh, Ray, I'm gonna yes, sir. hand you the proclamation, and Thomas, we're gonna call on you to take a picture, please. Maybe we should just keep it to the actual EMS folks. Because All right. If you guys... Are here for the next part of it. <laughs> I agree. Well, you, you get shot twice, possibly. <laughs> Board? I'm good. I'm good. It's about them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. It's good to see you, buddy. I'm good to see you. Thank you so much. Man, if you guys would come forward. I was going to get you in two shots. <laughs> we have before us Sheriff Terry Johnson, uh, the police chief of Mebbin, uh, Mitch McKinney, the police chief of, Grant, of Gibsonville, uh, Ray Parrish. And I, I know um, Ron Parrish. I've known uh, Ray and Terry for about a hundred and well, not quite that long, <laughs> a long time. You <laughs> And Christy Baker, of course, police chief of the city of Graham. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, lady, we have a proclamation here, uh, which is Law Enforcement Month 
and uh, the Peace Officers Memorial Day, which is coming up next week. So, and we want to, we have a motion which board you have read. Do we have a motion to approve this proclamation? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? You get shot if you oppose. <laughs> okay. While you're doing that, John, I want to give a shout out to a private citizen called me about doing this for them. And I contacted Heidi and Tori, and they got this together, you know, quick last week. So this person was just, um, it just done something about the Charlotte, what happened with Charlotte. And they really wanted to let sure that all of our first responders, especially law enforcement, knows how much we appreciate you and what you do. So I didn't want to forget that. He told <laughs> me not to dare mention his name, so I'm not. Well, I, I got a call from the same gentleman. Don't say it. <laughs> uh, and was very appreciative. Uh, and we'll all see each other, I guess, next Monday for Memorial Day at the monument instead of because of rain inside the church. <laughs> okay. Law Enforcement Officers Month and Peace Officers Memorial Day 2024. Whereas the brave men and women of law enforcement answer the call to serve and protect our communities. And whereas enduring long shifts in dangerous and unpredictable circumstances, law enforcement officers risk their lives so the communities, families, and people of our county can live in peace and security. Whereas the members of law enforcement agencies play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedom of all residents of Alamance County, and whereas members of law enforcement recognize their duty to serve the people of Alamance County by safeguarding life and property, protecting against violence and disorder, protecting, protecting the innocent from deception and the weak from oppression and intimidation, and whereas our nation observes Law Enforcement Officers Week and Peace Officers Memorial Day during the month of May to show um, th these dedicated professionals the appreciation they deserve. Whereas throughout May, law enforcement agencies and other businesses, organizations, and individuals will hold events and ceremonies across Alamance County to celebrate the selfless public servants who wear the badge and put themselves in harm's way to keep us safe. Whereas on Peace Officers Memorial Day, we pay respect to those who have lost their lives in the line of duty. <coughs> Terry, how many did we celebrate last Monday? Thirteen. From Alamance County. In case you couldn't hear that, 13 gave their lives in Alamance County through this date. We hope there are no more but we honor those that did. In the line of duty and recognize with deep gratitude the uh, critical contributions and sacrifices of all law enforcement officers and their families. And whereas during the month and throughout the year, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners uh, commends our members of law enforcement at all levels and honors their courage and dedication now, therefore, we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim May 2024 as Law Enforcement Officers Month and recognize Peace Officers Memorial Day in Alamance County and commend its observance to all citizens. We thank you. It's so good to see you. Ms. Thompson, I'm going to ask you to join the rest of us. Terry, if you will hold this up. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. You don't get off this easy. You have to turn around and get your picture. Yes, <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Ron, appreciate it. I'll get you one from the county. Thank <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And he should have board meeting tonight, too. Good to see you, Rob. Okay. Next on our agenda are public comments. Uh, let me spell out the rules before we bring anybody forward. Uh, they are called in the order that they are on our list. Uh, you have a total of 30 minutes, and our procedure does not allow us to go beyond 30 minutes. Uh, if we have multiple speakers on the same topic, you can choose to have one of, one of the members speak for you. Um, we have listed 15, and you, you receive three minutes each. The county commissioners are prohibited at this point from commenting about any speaker or the topic of their speech. At the end of our agenda uh, tonight, uh, the public may well hear a, a comment about those that do give a comment, um, but we're prohibited from speaking while you're speaking. You must address this board, uh, not the audience, uh, but address this board only. Uh, and we are not allowed to answer questions or make comments during your speech. We're gonna give you your full three minutes. And they are timed, by the way. And so if you hear the gong go off, or a buzzer or whatever. That was supposed to be funny. Uh, it's pretty bad when I try to tell a joke and nobody laughs. So, <laughs> but in any event, uh, we're gonna give you at least your three minutes. We are prohibited because there's so many speakers going beyond the three minutes. Mr. Chair, just briefly, I wanted to point out, I did some quick math in my head. If we have 15 speakers and three minutes apiece, we're going to be over 30 minutes. Which so. means we have to uh, curtail it at the end of the 30 minutes. And Mr. Walker, you'll notify us on the 30 minutes. I really apologize for that. Uh, and if you, if you guys, uh, yeah, I've got school board budget over and over and over again. Uh, I will allow you guys to have five minutes if you wish to allow one person um, to speak for a group of you if you wish to do that. But obviously, as the county attorneys just pointed out, we will not get through the entire list if each person takes three minutes. Uh, would you like four or five minutes to decide who's going to speak? I can get a head shakes no, so I'll just go down the list. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, you may want to mention about the public hearing. We're going to have upcoming public hearing where everybody gets to speak. That's correct. Um, and they have to give their address. When you approach, if you will, uh, as I announce your name, go to the um, microphone over here announce your name and your address, please. Um, and the clock will then start. Okay. The public hearing. What? Tell them about the public hearing. Yeah, Mr. Carter is suggesting that I tell you that we do have a public hearing. Uh, scheduled for June 3rd. Scheduled for June the 3rd. Uh, June the 3rd is on our agenda. Uh, not just education, it's on the Sheriff's Department, Social <coughs> Services, all the various departments and offices and so forth that we have. And those, uh, you'll, you'll not have be limited to three minutes. So some of you may want to not speak tonight, uh, but speak at the public hearing in lieu of that, which will be our first meeting in June. Now do you want a couple of minutes? Yeah. No, 
for, for the threshold school, if we could, if we need to know who our speakers are. We know we have two here, but we don't know, yes. don't know who signed up. All right. How close to the front of the line are you? Give me a name. Could you read all the names? Well, uh, no, because there's so many. Uh, why don't we do this? We'll start down the list, and we get to the first of your speakers. If someone wants to speak for your group, just announce that. All right? Okay. Uh, Michael McElrath. I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that correctly at all. M C E L R E A T H. Mikael Fritz. <coughs> Mr. Walker, how many people do we have in the annex? Yeah, about uh, 45. Wow. Okay. All right. Start Who is Michael? These okay. are my students, they're going to talk first. All right. You have three minutes. Uh, and please address this board. Okay. Thank you. We can switch in between the yeah. stage, yeah, right. right? Okay. And if you will, each of you state your name. Okay. Uh, and where you live. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, hi, my name is Allison Lee, and I am from, well, we both, we, all three of us are from Cary Academy, um, located in, uh, around the Raleigh area in the Triangle. And basically we are students, or uh, we're a class that's basically focusing on a, a community research and activism. So we decided to focus on food, food insecurity, specifically in the Alamance County. Um, so we were thinking of the idea to, of using food trucks to solve that problem. So we were thinking of using food trucks to both combat food insecurity while also promoting economic growth. The trucks would be run by entrepreneurs looking for ways of making income or looking for ways to serve their community. And the tr food trucks would aim to sell affordable and healthy foods in food swamps and deserts while also giving out recipe cards for those who buy the food so they can make it at home. Um, right now, uh, the YMCA in Alamance County actually has a food truck that they um, were donated and don't know what to do with. So we're trying to talk with them and get a partnership with them to be able to test this idea out. Um, so yeah, we're, we're in talks with them. Now we chose food trucks because they can provide, ac um, they provide access to healthy food uh, while also fostering the entrepreneurial growth um, of the county. The food truck industry was worth $2.2 .2 billion in 2023 and the average income for a food truck yearly is $32,988. Um, thank you so much for listening. We're not really seeking any monetary uh, resources from the county commissioners as we believe nonprofits in the county have what they need to make a go of this pilot program but we would uh, like two things one your blessing to continue this program alongside with um, additional ideas or uh, people to speak to on this idea Very good. This you still have time if you want to my name is Michael this is Julian who just spoke we're, we're a small class but we focus on a topic that they chose they chose to focus on food insecurity in North Carolina <laughs> We eventually circled around to what's a county that's sort of representative of some of the economic needs around the state and also food desert situations around the state. Alamance seemed kind of representative. It was close enough for us to get to. So that's why we chose Alamance. Uh, there are phenomenal organizations in this county working on this issue already. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to promote this one idea among many others that need to be tried. That food truck is sitting uh, you know, unused on uh, Highway 54. <laughs> so we'd like to get it into use and maybe use it to provide healthy food options around the county. Thanks very much. And we thank you. Yeah, I'll give them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Perala. He's right here. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Ed Priola. I live at 747 South 8th Street in Mebane. Come to talk tonight about the Board of Education's plan to slam taxpayers with a 27% increase in their budget. I think we need to question substantial parts of this budget. Uh, giving in would, to all of it would be a mistake, and here's why. Since Superintendent Harrison's first tenure at ABSS th during the 20. 14 and 2015 school year, student enrollment has dropped 2.4%. The number of ABSS personnel, in fact, during that same period, declined by 
percent. But let's look at actually what changed. The number of teachers dropped by 4.2 percent, but the number of administrators increased by 9.8 percent, and the number of other professionals like social workers and counselors increased 12.3 percent. If teaching is the core mission of ABSS, why did it shrink the ranks of teachers while swelling the ranks of administrators? Why does the Board of Education's budget preserve those swelled ranks? For example, ABSS plans to continue employing an additional 60 social workers and counselors above and beyond what the state pays for with the state funding. Most PAC taxpayers would reasonably say, well, you know, we can assume social workers and counselors, well, they have the kids in mind. They're working for the kids. A quick review of their professional association websites, the counselors, the social workers, and others, would provide other evidence, evidence to the contrary. The North Carolina School Social Workers Association declares that social workers are expected to promote the belief that the United States, and I quote, is rooted, quote, in a culture of white supremacy through systematic exploitation and oppression of non-white people, unquote. Want more evidence? The ABSS school counselor who recently won the national prize for the National uh, American School Counselors Association uh, was required to take DEI training, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her training, among other things, included how to expose systemic racism and, and as it manifests in schools, in ABSS schools. She had to also tell people, practice telling people, how to stop saying that, quote, all lives matter, unquote. Lastly, she had to acknowledge her own, and I quote again, white guilt, unquote. So today I urge this board to reject giving ABSS more money to promote the bigotry of DEI. Instead, savings could be used to give high quality teacher raises so they can educate and not indoctrinate. Thanks for your time. Thanks, sir. Camille, is it Mackelson? Mickelson, thank you. She's next, but she's in minor, so she's coming with me this morning. All right. Hi, I'm Camille Mickelson. Um, I'm a parent of students in ABSS, and I live in Haw River, 27258. Um, and I want to talk about the school budget that is going to be proposed to you. I'm, we know that it's the state's responsibility to fund education. We know that there's all sorts of reasons why the state needs to step up and provide more funding. But we live here now, and it's Alamance's job to step up for Alamance now. The budget that Harrison, that Dr. Harrison will give you is, quote, fiscally responsible, meaning it cuts back on spending now, but that doesn't mean it's fiscally responsible for the future. Um, it does not meet student needs now, it does not meet teacher needs now, and it will ultimately diminish Alamance County, its economy and business, as well as education. Um, it will not prevent future disruptions like we faced at the beginning of this school year. It will not prevent future mold growth because the underlying issues have not been dealt with. The like surface mold has been cleared off, but there are underlying issues that need to be taken care of and we really need to fund a joint building study in order to get all the information and then we need you to step up and fund it. You need to agree to fund it because otherwise our kids are gonna continue getting sick from mold that supposedly doesn't exist but does actually exist in schools. Um, we need to increase our investment in our school system if we want Alamance County to thrive. In 10 years, if we continue with budget cuts and forcing the schools to make choices that are not good for students or teachers, I guarantee we will see a diminished economy and Alamance County, County will become, it will be left behind. On the map of North Carolina, no one is going to want to live here if the schools are not good schools and if we don't fund them appropriately. Real fiscal responsibility is investing now for reduced expenditures later and you will set yourselves up for success if you fund schools now. The full 18 million that the school district needs 
what what Dr. Harrison is going to present to you is not even what we need. It's below what we need, and it will not serve our students well. Thank you. I'm done. Just so you My name is... I'm done. She is the next person on the list, though. You're Miss Lockerbie. Okay. okay. I'm... Actually, the next person. Oh, just kidding. She Sorry. Can, she can take part of, okay. You can take part of what I have to say. Basically, I have everything to say. My name is Elizabeth Lockley, and I'm at 459 Cook Road in Elon. And I will second everything that Camille had to say. However, my family moved here in 1988 partly because Williams was one of the top schools in the state. And my parents had an opportunity to kind of pick where we were landing when we were moving to North Carolina. And I have watched since I graduated way back in the 20th century, Burlington City Schools and then ABSS decline. I have raised two sons in this school district. Um, they graduated in 2019 and um, 2023. Uh, when my elder started kindergarten in 2006, it was actually a pretty good school system and started going down and down and down and it's just going down further. And I would put a challenge until we can get the state to fund education to follow their mandates, I think the county needs to step up and maybe pay, oh, 25 to 30 million. And you can have the rest of my time. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Trinia Walker. I am a fourth grader at Pleasant Grove Elementary. And today we had to leave school early because there, there was no water and I needed to use the restroom. Please, please find a building study and, and disruption at ABSS. We could not use soap because the water was off. Everybody started going home. Miss Penix. Oh, by the way, good job. Good evening. My name is Ebony Penix. I am an Alamance County citizen. I don't want to give my address. Um, <clears throat> I am here today because that is my daughter, and true indeed today, the water was off at Pleasant Grove because the plumbing was messed up. Um, not only was their education disrupted, but I had to get off of work because I am a single mother. Um, I can't afford to get off of work. So we are here today asking you guys to fund a building study, a comprehensive building study of all of the in-person schools. Um, when you find out that number, we are asking you guys to honor it and create some generational investments. Um, since the beginning of the school year, there's been a lot of disruptions, beginning with the mold and the leaky roofs after the mold was taken care of. And then you got kids needing to go see counselors and different things of the sort, and they can't go see their counselor because there may or not may not be one, or it, the counselor might be at this school or this school. Um, it's important that our kids get a good education. You only have one time to get it. They got the whole rest of their life to do everything else, but they don't. They shouldn't have to worry about whether uh, there, there's rain leaking in the floor or if they can go to the restroom. Like it really hurt my heart when my daughter told me she had to use the bathroom, and I had to tell her, "Hey, I'm." on the Zoom meeting, and I can't come get you right now. So she had to wait another 30 to 45 minutes for me to get there. I believe that there is a way to, to get these schools up to par. 
and they need to be. Um, it's not safe. My son, he has asthma, and it seems to be worse when he comes home. He'll have a stuffy nose. After a while, it gets better, goes back to school the next day, comes home with a stuffy nose. It's something else in there. And I know the mole has been addressed, but just wiping it off can't be it. So we are asking for that full comprehensive building study. Thank you. Thank you. Sawyer Jones. I like your first name. <laughs> my name is Sawyer Jones, and I'm not going to say my address at this time. Good evening, commissioners. Are you County resident? Yes, I am. Right. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Sawyer Jones, and I'm a sophomore at Walter and Williams High School. Tonight, I'm here to talk about a critical issue that impacts not only my own educational journey, but that of every student in our district, which is the chronic underfunding of our schools, both by the state and local government. Despite education being touted as the cornerstone of our progress, our schools face significant challenges due to an inadequate funding. We lack support staff, suffer from high teacher turnover, and have insufficient academic support. These issues have been ongoing here in ABSS. A significant challenge we face is a lack of support structures for students and families who are not able to find information on their own. This year, recognizing a gap in our support system, I started Pathway Academy to aid incoming freshman students at Walter and Williams High School with peer-assisted academic and career planning. We realized that our guidance counselors, overwhelmed with caseloads of about 500 students, cannot provide personalized guidance every student needs and deserves. Pathway Academy is offering personalized discussions, resources, and guidance about potential programs and contactable adults in various fields. But this program cannot replace the trusted assistance and advice of professionals trained to help students with planning their future. I would like to talk with you about the cutting of the graduation coach positions at the high schools. These coaches are vital in helping students manage academic pressures, plan for the future, excuse me, plan for the future and navigate the complex paths towards graduation. They play a crucial role in reducing dropout rates and ensuring students transition successfully from high school to higher education or the workforce. Without these professionals, many students are at risk of falling behind at Williams High School, I have witnessed Ms. Smith work tirelessly with teachers and students to ensure they are passing, assisting them in finding tutors, and collaborating with students and their families to ensure constant school attendance. Ms. Smith is our graduation coach. These students often work after school to help families, to help families pay with expenses and have little experience with jobs beyond low-wage positions. As a community, we should want to put in place support to help students reach their full potential. As I have learned in my economics and government classes, an educated, productive citizen provides a strong tax base for the local economy. Please find a way to increase the funding for the positions that are being cut. The chronic underfunding not only undermines the quality of our education, but also reflects a troubling lack of investment in our future. Every student, regardless of their background, deserves an education that fully prepares them for their future challenges and opportunities. Thank you. May I ask what year at Williams? Yes. You, what year are you? I'm a sophomore. Thank you. Ian Benj Benjamin. And I'll ask you students to give me your, uh, in addition to the name and address, uh, give us the school and the grade you're in, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, esteemed member of the County Commission. Uh, my name is Ian Benjamin, and I'm a senior at Walter M. Williams High School. I also as well live in Burlington, North Carolina, area code 27215. Um, it's an honor to stand before you guys today to discuss an issue that not only impacts my peers, like Sawyer said, but also myself and our entire community. Our school system is chronically underfunded. Um, my passion for education has driven me to pursue a career as a math teacher. This fall, I'm going to be attending UNCG. And um, my commitment to education does not end with my own academic achievements, but I do want to return to Williams High School 
as a math teacher because I found that that's my passion. That is my dream. But I can't return without proper funding for the school. Um, thanks to the efforts of our school system and support from the community, every student at Williams High School now has a one-on-one -on -one device that they're able to access the internet with. Um, however, having these tools, such as our Chromebooks, is just the first step. <clears throat> we need to learn how to effectively utilize these technologies to enhance our learning. <clears throat> to integrate this technology effectively across all subjects, we need dedicated training for both students and teachers. Our teachers are eager to help us succeed, but require further support and professional development to guide us in using these digital tools daily. This will ensure that we are not just tech savvy, but also competent and efficient in a digital first world. This teaching and support currently come from the media specialist at our school, who daily works with teachers and students on technology. Next year, we are being told that we will not have him anymore and will be re he'll be replaced with only a part-time media specialist. And Mr. Ringwald, who is our librarian and media specialist, is highly qualified. I have seen Mr. Ringwald working individually and in groups with teachers to implement or teach a new technology in the classroom. I have benef benefited from this that year in my honors economics and personal finance class. Um, Mr. Ringwald and my teacher worked together for one week to guide us into finding information to write a research paper and make an annotated bibliography. This included direct instruction from both Mr. Ringwald and my classroom teacher as they walked us through queries for researching our assigned subject in macroeconomics and then helped us determine cred credible articles and how to use and cite them. This will be invaluable to me as I begin college this fall and enter programs that will expect me to have knowledge, have this knowledge to be successful. Therefore, I urge you to prioritize educational funding that supports both te technological tools and the professional development of educators. Please keep the media specialist a full-time position at schools. The students and teachers need the support and assistance. This will ensure you that we not only have access, access to technology, but are also proficient in using it to its full potential. One thing I want to add before my time is up is that without Mr. Ringwall, I probably wouldn't be graduating this year. He helped me get my GPA up from a 1.8 starting sophomore year after COVID to a 3.6 and, and rising. Is it Romez Blunt? Good evening, members of the County Commission. My name is Ramiz Butt, and I'm a sophomore at Walter Williams High School. And uh, I just moved to Burlington a f not more than a year ago, so my perspective on the under, under budget issue is a bit different. So I moved from Malaysia to Burlington in the summer of 2023. And thanks to Ms. <coughs> Grant, our school's guidance counselor, my transition into this new educational environment has been smoother than I could have imagined. Initially, like many students from abroad, I was placed in standard level classes. However, Ms. Grant took time to review my grades after the first semester and recognized my ability to handle more academically challenging work. Seeing my potential, she took the initiative and reassessed my situation and successfully moved me into advanced placement classes. This significantly enhanced my learning experience and academic growth. I plan to attend college when I graduate, and she explained that these classes will allow me to have some credits in college when I start. Ms. Grant's support didn't just help me academically, it boosted my confidence and showed me that the school believes in my potential. Ms. Grant worked diligently to ensure that my foreign language credits from Malaysia were recognized here. Guidance counselors like Ms. Grant are critical in helping students navigate their education, especially for those of us adjusting to a new country and a new school system. Given the pivotal role that guidance counselors play, it is essential to ensure their positions that are protected from budget cuts. Reducing the number of counselors not only increases the student to counselor ratio, but also limits their ability to provide personalized support like what I received. This could, have, this could leave many students feeling overwhelmed and unsupported, negatively impacting their academic performance and overall well-being. Therefore, I urge you to maintain or increase funding for our school's counseling services. Investing in these services is investing in the futures of students like me. With adequate support, 
all students, especially those transitioning from different education and cultural backgrounds, like myself, can thrive. Thank you very much. Lilith Stewart. Aha, uh -huh, we did get to you. <laughs> we'll, st we'll store Alamance County. Hello, commissioners. My name is Lil Stewart. I'm one of the sixth graders at Alamance Virtual School. I'm standing here this evening to ask you to approve the budget that the school board has sent to you that includes keeping our school open. Alamance Virtual has been a positive experience for its students. Being a part of a school and community has helped me grow confidence in myself and has encouraged me to stand up for what is in the best interest for other families and kids. Some would say this is an adult situation and our thoughts as kids do not matter. I'm here to say every decision made in this county has a impact on its future adults. I will be one of those adults one day. AVS matters along with all the other schools. It makes a difference as has changed so many lives of children in Alamance County. I'm an AVS Dragon and I want to be a part of a school that has teachers, parents, and a principal that cares about their students. We look forward to each new day at school and are excited to learn. Our lives and education is in your hands now. Let's learn in our AVS school and let's grow to be smart, healthy, happy adults. Show us that we matter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Lisa. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Lisa Duclo, and I am a teacher at Walter Williams High School. Um, I am not a resident of Burlington currently. Um, I have been teaching at Walter Williams for three years. I live in Durham, but it is my intent to move here to Alamance County. I love the, the school that I teach at. I teach economics and personal finance. I teach honors levels and I teach standard levels. And these classes are composed of very different students with very vastly different academic abilities and future aspirations. However, regardless of their path in life, it is undeniable that mastering reading and writing skills is essential to their pursuits after high school. Despite their diverse futures, many of our students, including those in the advanced placement and the IB program, struggle with writing and comprehensive reading. Research consistently demonstrates that integrating reading and writing activities into core subject classes is essential for enhancing student literacy skills and writing skills across the board. This cross-curriculum disciplinary approach encourages students to interpret and synthesize information in varied formats, much like they will experience in the world where they will be working. It is fundamental to developing proficient readers and writers who can navigate the academic and the real working world. This year, a group of teachers and school specialists at Williams High School has been actively pursuing a strategy of interdepartmental writing that is scheduled to be used next school year. Teachers, along with myself, have been working with students this semester to pilot what we are planning to initiate school-wide. This initiative requires significant time and effort from everyone involved to ensure that we, as a school, are reinforcing consistent methods of instruction across the different departments within the school system and across different grade levels. Our instructional specialist, Dr. Webb, and our media specialist have been instrumental in this effort. We have been told both of their positions will not be there next year. They are crucial in helping us implement and effectively main the school-wide approach to writing. The strategic alignment that they facilitate not only enhances our curriculum, but also ensures that our students are better prepared for the challenges ahead. The proposed cuts will directly impact our students and their learning experiences. 
I am here tonight to ask you to please ensure that the funding for the specialist at the schools continues so that the teachers can do their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, is it Gauls? Mr. Chair, there is eight minutes left on the 30-minute timer. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Galls. I live at 2854 Gibsonville Ospey Road. And what I'm going to be discussing probably isn't something that you want to hear about. I would like to uh, discuss the issues that we are having in our schools. It is believed that my 13-year-old child was recruited as a confidential informant by the SRO. My, I have another child who was denied IEP services for six years video upon request. I have Jason Sawyer's mm -hmm. making that statement. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest, there was a principal who kept trying to get her in a office by herself. Um, the bus driver would take her back to the school even though I was at home. I contacted central office. There was nothing done. I, in regards to my son's IEP, I contacted the board several times, sent emails to people, and all I got was shuffled around to this person, that person, till he basically graduated without receiving anything. My other son, they thought that he might benefit from services, but I wanted to get my other son straightened out before we started the whole process for another child as I am dying. Um, and they held the conference without me and stated that I didn't care. My other, my daughter, the one that we believe was solicited by the SRO, went on to, I mean, she graduated early, top of one of her, top of her class at AVS. My children all are at AVS and graduated from AVS as I didn't want to risk my youngest child's safety because it didn't feel like it was a concern. We have more officers in our schools than at any point in history, and I had to worry about my youngest child going to school. I've contacted numerous people, including the county manager, and I was told that that wasn't something they really handled or addressed. I contacted Senator Gailey, and despite numerous articles regarding her interacting with the school, she stated that was not her problem. So that is why I'm here tonight. I don't want to be here. I don't want, because I know there's so many employees that go to work every day in this county and they're not paid their worth. They aren't. But I feel like there are a big number of employees in this county who are taking advantage of the nepotism that is running rampant. Um, my children and I have literally spent the last few years being stalked by an individual who's a relative of Mr. Johnson. We contacted the sheriff's office repeatedly and he did nothing. It was discovered that his cousin, Judge um, Samantha Hyatt Cabe, is believed to have forged the signature of another judge in Orange County Thursday. That's when I spoke to Judge Merle about this. Um, this individual had even hacked into my Google account and watched our every move for five years. And Deputy Brinkley with the Sheriff's Department stated that there was nothing they could do, despite that's a federal crime, and this individual was caught really in my Google apologize. account. Thank you. To be fair to it's others. a lot. I have 23 pounds of documentation, not including the digital, and I've literally reached my wit's yeah, end. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening. Matthew Townsend. Well, uh, Matthew is approaching. Remember, we cannot comment as county commissioners until the county commissioners comment period. Um, and I suspect um, at that point there will be comment. I would encourage you to stay, stick around. Yes, sir. Good evening, Honorable Commissioners. My name is Matthew Townsend. I live in Mebane at 2025 Stonebrook Drive. With my fantastic wife, Susan, who's also an educator, 
We've been here for 25 years. I was a band director here starting in 1999 at Eastern Alamance High School. And uh, to, as things got more expensive and wages didn't go anywhere, I took on a bus route in the morning, took on a bus route in the afternoons. So I'd get up at 4.30, drive a bus, teach all day, drive a bus, go home, grade papers, and just did it till I was weary to the bones. And I went over to Orange County where I got the exact same paycheck to just teach. And then I went to Durham County where I got another $5,000 more a year than Orange County paid and I could, you know, go out to dinner. It was quite nice. And anyhow, I've just come over. I still live here. I love this place. I love the teachers here. I love the schools here. Last year, over 10,000 North Carolina teachers walked out of the classrooms. 10,000. Each of those is a heartbreaking story of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. Retired teachers leaving, giving up. New teachers who invested enormous amounts of time, energy, and money just walking away. To cope, our schools have hired 11,000 unlicensed teachers. And Alamance County has hired a lot of unlicensed teachers. And Alamance County has also struggled to even hire teachers for empty classrooms. Now, I want to be clear, the cause of the crisis is not a mystery, and the cause of the crisis is not in this room. The cause of the crisis is the North Carolina General Assembly not living up to their responsibility. There's a constitutional mandate to provide for a sound, basic education, and their staffing levels, one guidance counselor for a school with 600 people, two teacher assistants for three kindergarten classrooms, a giant high school with two assistant principals, those are not the staffing levels of a school. A school system in 2024 is not a school system of 1984. We have expanded roles and expanded responsibilities. And when Alamance County sends 70 of these positions off, the work of the 70 positions does not disappear. The work of the 70 positions gets inherited. When you take the media specialist at the middle school and you say, now you're going to be at the middle school and you're going to be at the high school, and that media specialist is the softball coach and the testing coordinator and leads a club, none of those things go away. If that media specialist had before school and after school duty, those things don't go away. They get piled on to the other teachers, and those teachers do what I do. They're going to get weary, and your best ones are going to walk away. Alamance County deserves great teachers just like all the other counties. And I've taught in Guilford County, Alamance County, Orange County, and I'm now in Durham. We have a fantastic community that's deserving of investment. The question is, how do we pay for it? Ah. <laughs> and we thank you. Appreciate you guys. Even though we may or may not go a second or two over the, the 30 minutes, this is the last speaker so, board, can we give the full three three minutes? Everybody yeah. agree? Sure. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bristol, is it Spurgo? I'm sorry. She's in the other room. I'll we'll solve that problem. <laughs> Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. All right. Hello, my Myard School Board. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I messed up already. Hello, my uh, hello, my admired co county commissioners. I am Bristol Spargo, and I'm an eighth grader from ABS. Uh, for stars, I didn't think I. Uh, well, no, I can't say that because <laughs> I thought I was speaking to the school board, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> Is the mic okay? <laughs> is it okay if I just Bruce, read it? is the mic off over there? It's on. Do your thing. Okay. Okay. For starters, I didn't think I'd be here once more after my speech in February and after the few meetings over budget. I figured this ultimatum over and done. But it turns out there's still talk of a conclusion upon the ABS virtual school. As I already have, I can't come back, uh, come back and speak upon my story, nor would I be comfortable go to go into depth regarding any moments that happened during those times. However, I can express my full adorance and devotion to the school. Not only is ABS a safe, uh, safe space for students by, like myself, others, and definitely could be to those on the wait list. 
And while it took me a while to grow close to the people I can call my friends, I cannot find the words to say how thankful I am to have finally spoken to my classmates this year, grow close with them, and form strong, both strong and healthy relationships with them. The students are not the only, uh, the students are not only one of the most and lovable things though. The teachers are incredibly accommodating and amazing. I've had my math, science, and social studies teachers by my side since the beginning, and I can say with certainty I will not miss only the three of them, but them all. Since since the beginning or not, uh, they helped me and they were there for me. They have all been incredible to me, and I couldn't ask for a better middle school teacher lineup because they are all uh, perfect to me. Overall, I love everything. Uh, I love everything about and everything that is ABS. It, and it ending would mean leaving this all behind. I'd hate to not see my friends every day next year and the sorrow I'd feel for my teachers no longer being a part of what they love most, most online or not. They do, they do their jobs and they love them and they do them perfectly. I've had growth of my grades and GPA overall and it's because of ABS and the safe spaces I can be at. My sister's house, my house, anywhere and I'll still be safe and that's what I love most of all. We thank each and every speaker uh, for your comments. Uh, Williams High School, you need to be proud. So, <laughs> and pass that on to your other fellow students. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Why don't I raise a question? I know a lot of you may not stay in the, in the room until we finish this meeting and until we have our opportunity for comments. And I do want to ask a question of uh, our county manager. Um, as of this afternoon, when, when we last spoke, we had not yet received the budget. Am I correct? Well, what we received on Friday evening was their PowerPoint presentation, which I think they're in that as the budget request. There's still no budget. That's all I received was the PowerPoint slides. Right. I just wanted to clarify that references were being made to a budget. We don't have a budget from ABSS as yet. That's when correct. was the budget due? It's due on May 15th, according to statute. Yeah. Just to comment, uh, North Carolina General Statute 115C 424 requires the school system to provide the, a written budget to us no later than May 15th, which is la this past Wednesday, along with uh, reports about the individual schools, the grade um, performance for each school, and which schools were failing. Um, as of this minute, I have not received anything. Ms. Manager, have you received a budget, written budget, or the other materials as required by the North Carolina General Statute? Okay. We just don't have it. Uh, okay. We have the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? You know All right, at this point, um, we're going to take up the topic that was added to our agenda. Mr. Turner, you want to? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a, a question about, um, and perhaps some some, generate some discussion about the coming high school bleachers. I know that's been a topic of conversation. And I noticed at the ABSS, ABSS's last meeting, uh, Mr. Hook said that there was a plan that they could, they could fund that in time for football season, but they had to have those uh, approval for the funding by June 1st. And there's no PAYGO left in this fiscal year, and I know that there's going to be an infusion for ABSS capital uh, spending, but that's not going to happen, I think, until after the end of the fiscal year, too. Uh, but there is about $1.7 million left in bond funds, which could be used for that and could be used to accelerate the, that um, that fix so that those bleachers could be ready for football season. Um, and I just had a question uh, from Mr. Baker about whether, uh, well, I think there's some concern about whether the fix is adequate or whether there should be we should wait to do a fix that's more comprehensive and I don't know if Dr. Harrison has any uh, thoughts on that particular issue uh, but but I know that if we're going to make a decision to fund something for football season we need to make a decision before June 1st and so here we are 
Um, do you have a, Mr. Baker, a recommendation for Mr. Hook about what it is that they'd like to see? So that's correct. There's, there's two options. Um, the only one of those could get done before football season, which would be to temporarily repair the bleachers or, or to repair the bleachers. As our old bleachers, they were handed from, down from Duke University about 40 years ago. Wow. We don't really know how long they were used uh, prior to that time. So they, they are in need of significant repair. That's $325,000 to repair the foundations, to bring them up to the safety codes that they need to be. Um, Mr. Hook told me it was 1.1 to completely replace the bleachers. Um, I think that would be a reasonable expense, but that could not be done by football season uh, this year. So just a choice to be made about which direction we want to go. Mr. Baker, what are they going to do between now and, and football season? So the supports of the bleachers themselves just have some, some rust and need to be shored up. So they are going to add uh, pieces of metal to the angle iron supports uh, to make sure they're strong enough to handle the crowd there. They're going to add um, in between the two layers of bleachers where you sit and where your feet go, there should be a, another piece of metal that prevents <coughs> people and things from falling off the bleachers, that is not there. It just wasn't a code when those things were built. So it would actually also put that in place uh, to make them safer. So that's that's what we need to get it safe for the fall. Now, you folks out in TV land and in the audience here, we county commissioners cannot make the school board make changes. Uh, we can encourage it. We've talked about it several meetings but it's up to the school board to make those changes. We give them the money, and that's as far as we have control. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Jim. Ms. Thompson? I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. I, I want to speak after you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, we're talking $325,000. I know this is really petty, but this is how I feel about this. It is a Band-Aid situation, and I'm not going to support a Band-Aid situation. If we put up $325,000, we, the citizens, everybody that belongs to these school systems, and in a year or two, we're needing more, more done to it. By the next year, we could have done bought and paid and done brand new bleachers. I think Cummins deserves new bleachers. They've been the stepchild long enough. I think they deserve to be safe. It is ridiculous, I think, to spend a third to fix something and it's not completely what it needs to be. It's just one of those kind of situations where I, I've heard about the, the jail years ago when Mr. Bird was on this commission board. He said, let's replace the whole roof instead of band-aiding it. We've seen our roofs in our schools where we've band-aided it. We are in a mess because of band-aids. That's just how I feel. I don't have $325,000. I buy a lottery ticket every Wednesday thinking I'm going to win and I'm going to fix it myself. But the key is it for it to stay fixed and to stay maintained and stay in really good shape. I want the best for these kids. I want them to be ready to play football, have a great season, and their moms and dads and grandparents to sit in those bleachers embarrassing their children by yelling their heads off. That's what I used to do. But at the same time, I don't want us having to come back in another year and asking for this again. You saw it firsthand. You went under the bleachers. You showed me pictures. I've seen a lot of comments this morning. I got other pictures that I'm going to talk about in my board comments. I just don't understand why we think this way. And we think in this way has got us in this situation. I think they deserve a new set of bleachers because of the old hand-me-downs, however old they are and where they are now. They're not safe to fix something for this kind of money, and then it's still not going to be what you need. I mean, it's kind of like the press box at Eastern. It's kind of like needing paint in the press box at Cummins. Everywhere you go, we need to fix something, but we're just band-aiding it. And band-aids get expensive, and sooner or later they peel off and they go down the drain. And that's just my opinion. If they've got the money, if we can find the money to do new bleachers at this school, and newsflash, there's a bunch of high schools. They can rotate fields and work together. They got a great athletic director, Todd Davis, can make this work with scheduling. These are all of our kids. They can play on a field, just like the baseball team that they're not going to have at Cummins. They could have played on Fairchild. I mean, let's go big league. But I'm just telling you, I think the school deserves this when it comes to the safety of their bleachers and not spending money two and three and four times down the road over and over. 
you are not looking at me because you don't want to look at me, and I told you I was going to do this, and I don't really care. <laughs> Brian's over there going, well, what's she going to do? But I just, I'm, I'm really passionate about this. I've heard about Cummins for a long time. When I was on the board for eight years, I saw Cummins in the worst of times. And once again, the worst of times, the most toxic mold of the schools. And, and oh, still got some issues. I'm not going to support this 325. Y'all can vote. 326. <laughs> but I'm not going to support it because I think they need new bleachers at this stadium because it is a football stadium. This, you just spent bukus of money on the school and the auditorium. Oh, my word. Let's get the school where it needs to be. Let's do this right. I mean, oh, that's all. Sorry, Craig. No, no, that's fine. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, mean, I was prepared to come in here and support ABSS's request for 325 to get this fixed by football season. I mean, Mr. Commissioner Thompson brings up some good points, though. Uh, I just don't want to miss the, the window to get something fixed by football season if we can. I wonder, you know, we, we're talking about a, a work session maybe prior to June 1st. I wonder if we might ask the school system to come in with option A, option B, uh, looking at this a little bit more so that we have a little bit more information to make a decision. I mean, the good news is I, I think we ought to make a decision and get this thing fixed. <clears throat> it's just a question of which way. I think that's, I think that's what I'd recommend. I agree. Mr. Carr. Oh, I, I agree. Uh -huh. I don't like wasting time repeating what he just said, if I can say I <laughs> You're such a I badass. totally agree, but this county passed multi-billion dollars, millions and millions of dollars, 2018 bond money. Part of that money is still sitting in the coffers, uh, and part of that, the county school. You understand, we provide money, but it's up to the school system and the school board and the school superintendent to make these things happen. And they've had the money all along to more than replace these bleachers. But we keep getting blamed and ask for more and more money when they've had the money all along. And why those priorities are not met. I think several of us have been over to look at the bleachers at Cummings High School. It's deplorable. Uh, and why the money was not spent between 2018 when those, what, 150 million, whatever it was. 150 million. 150 million dollars, and they couldn't afford bleachers. And that's the school board. You guys need to be calling the school board, not the county commissioners, because they're the ones that pull the plug and make it happen. We can give them the money. They've had the money, but they aren't applying it where these desperate needs are. And I apologize for fussing at the school board, uh, but I'm tired of receiving blame for something that we cannot make happen. Mr. Chairman, may the superintendent respond? Absolutely. Please come to the... Because this just came up. This wasn't an issue in 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. It's and just I, come up. And Dr. Harrison, we yeah. appreciate your being here. Additionally, I'd like to know what happened with no water at one of our elementary schools today. We had a, uh, a pump stopped pumping on us. And um, I'm sorry, a, a pump malfunctioned. And it took until we thought it was going to be ready at 1 o'clock. It, it was not. Uh, I made the decision not to send children home on a uh, sunny day when parents might not be expecting them. We'd have no way of contacting parents. If it were a snow day, people would be on the lookout. And so it was my decision to, to keep them in school. Um, the, I, w I was here when the bond package was put together. There were priorities set uh, with that bond, bond package, and we appreciate the commissioners working with us on that and uh, we've been working towards those priorities uh, the bleachers at Cummings were not part of that uh, that set of priorities so things have come up 150 million dollars is a heck of a lot of money but but things do happen as, as well um, I think we're on the way to spend this 325 and I appreciate you're looking at the uh, in, entire amount uh, but something would have to be put aside, and I think that's for us to, to decide together. I, I just, I don't think that the blame gets anybody anywhere. I, I think you, some of you know me from my 
last tenure here that uh, I don't think I ever stood in front of anybody and blamed anybody for anything else and for anything and I and I took responsibility if something was messed up with with getting the budget uh, to Miss York I take full responsibility for that we got the PowerPoint uh, to her on uh, either the afternoon of the 14th or the morning of the 15th because we knew that we had to get it uh, on the 15th I think there was a budget meeting on f February 25th I didn't get it until Friday afternoon. I did not receive it on Wednesday or Thursday. Okay, I will I will double check. I was assured I was out of town Tuesday afternoon and, and didn't get back. So um, my understanding, I don't know where that was sent to the, to the wrong place, but um, we fully scheduled it at that particular board meeting because we knew about the uh, the May 15th and the document that we sent was what we thought was, was required. And that's kind of what we sent in, in years past. Don't know what happened in the last couple of years, and uh, again, I think there's a conversation Miss York shared with me today back in February. Uh, I wasn't privy to that conversation, sure. and and a lot has changed since then. Uh, Rayvonda Johnston is our chief academic officer, has been standing in as our finance officer as well, and uh, she's been doing yeoman's work, and uh, she's new at it, and uh, thought we thought we were doing everything the way we needed to. So I, I apologize for that. Um, so that's. Just what I, I wanted to share, we, um, you know, and in the future, I'd ask, reach out directly to me if, if something doesn't get where it's supposed to be on time. Ultimately, it's it's on me, and uh, and I accept that. Um, I know we have to come to you to, to get the bond money released. Uh, from what I can tell, I, I mean, I've visited the, the new school, I've visited Southern, I've visited Western, visited Eastern, and I've seen the work of that bond, and there's that's, that's an awful lot for you guys to be proud of. and. Uh, so I think that money was, was well spent. Uh, I think the partnership that we had with the county that uh, with funding it through you saved us a heck of a lot of money on, on sales tax. If we would have done it mm -hmm. on our own, uh, I think we ended up with an extra couple of million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that's kind of the example of uh, what we can accomplish when we work together and, and don't try to point fingers at one another. We're all in this together. Any questions for me? You've got me up here. I'm, I, I've used my three minutes plus. Would you uh, check in? The, one of the speakers talked about um, an SRO using a student and whatever. Um, I found that a little tough to believe because I know many of your SROs and they are top notch people. Yeah, I, I wish uh, that would be brought directly to my attention. I don't believe um, I was ever contacted about that. Uh, we have a great relationship with the sheriff and the chiefs. Um, we have a good group of, of SROs. Um, we revisit what roles and responsibilities are from time to time. And, and to my knowledge, uh, we pretty much say you don't use uh, children as um, informants. Um, because I think someone said something at some point back, and we actually looked into that. I, I don't know whether it was the, the woman who spoke tonight or not. I know I circulated an email to, uh, I think, county management and you, the sheriff. You and did. The that's, board. that's where it came Back to my attention. I got it early this year. Yeah. I would that's ask that you just look into it and sure meet thing. with the sheriff and somebody get back with us and let us know that's not the scenario. I think Mr. Carter did bring it to my attention and we did look into it. I talked with the sheriff. I think, Mr. York, we may have talked as well, yeah. and uh, what was reported to us at that time was not accurate. That's what I heard. Thank you. Quick, quick question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Harrison, do you have uh, any insight on the Cummings Bleacher option A, option B? No. My my sense is we talked a little bit about it this morning, and I told my crowd they didn't need to come. Uh, I'm not sure that we can get the whole job done. Um, I don't think the replacement can can be done. I don't know that we can get materials to uh, get the bleachers replaced by the start of the football season. That does seem but aggressive. Um, maybe in a week you might have some more information. I can. I can have it for you tomorrow. Okay. Board, any other questions? We thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item is Sheriff well, Terry we have, John. We have a <coughs> You don't have a motion on the board. So we're dropping it? Why do we decide? Is that just discussion? Meeting on the 30th? Yep. Yes, sir. There you go. The discussion on the bleachers, are we tabling it until our meeting on the 30th? Did you get in trouble until we next? 
Commissioners, thank you for allowing me to come speak to you tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to clear up a thing. Uh, Dr. Harris and I, we have talked about, we do not use kids in school for informants. I want you to know that. Now, if they're a witness to something, yes, they will be questioned, but only if a parent is there or the, the parent allows a teacher or the principal. To, so I want to clear that out real quick. And she never contacted me. So thank you. I'd like to talk to you tonight about the problems in the Alamance County Sheriff's Department, our Sheriff's Office, and uh, some of the things that we're encountering. And um, I have a recommendation to the commissioners, uh, but I want to get started and just show you a few things. First of all, we talk about, and these are awful small, but you can see here and over there. Alamance County tax rate is point .4320. We have for years, since I've been sure of compared us with Randolph County and Davidson County. I would like to show you uh, Davidson and Ra or Randolph County is point five zero, and Davidson County is point fifty four. And we wonder why we're having problems with our money. Alamance County is the 13th lowest tax in the state of North Carolina of 100 counties. But not only are they, we're 15th in the population growth here in Alamance County. Everybody loves Alamance County, I'm glad they do, but with the population coming to Alamance County and growing, we're gonna have to grow our emergency services because the commissioners, there's two things you're supposed to look for. That's emergency services, that serve the people in our schools that educate our children. Okay, here's a look at your population growth in, from 21, uh, 2021 to 2022, population grew by 3,203 persons from 175,029 to 178,232. But that is not totally accurate. There is a group that will, does not want to be identified by the census that may have come across the border, that may have come in here illegally, et cetera. So right now, you're probably looking at 200,000 people here. But have we grown our emergency service or even we had to build a new high school? So we're having problems there. And Alamance County has the 16th highest crime rate in the state. You say, my gosh, sir. Yep. Well, I'm telling you, compare. Get, up, get on your computer. Contact your people. Why is that the case? One is lack of officers, personally, for the county. And, of course, the cities where a lot of the crime occurs. And we help with the cities, and the city helps us when it can. But uh, 23... Point four in violent crime out of a per uh, 100,000 popul uh, excuse me a thousand population, and the U.S. average is 22.7. If you don't believe me, get on your computer and check it. And that is continuing to grow. It's juveniles are getting more involved. Uh, our our schools is going to have to play a big part in helping us in law enforcement also, because a lot of them are certainly not getting raised properly by their family. 53.4 in property crimes here in Alamance County, and the national average is 35.4 per thousand population. We are at a time here in Alamance County where <coughs> there's more shootings, there's more juvenile crimes, there's no more problems in the school. And let me show you something. The green here is the safest areas. This is Alamance County. Elon, or your yellow is moderate crime, and your red is the highest crime. Look here. It's the reds here in Alamance County. And this is in the cities, too. Green level, uh, out toward Elon and that way. But these are the hot areas for crimes, just like this past weekend. We had a... Ch uh, uh, Caswell County had four people shot, three killed. 
Guess where they come to? They put out the bulletin. Where did the car come to with the suspect in it? Straight into Alamance County. We had a chase, got the vehicle stopped, and we're lucky we didn't lose an officer. But the guy shot himself, blew part of his head off, killed himself. We're constantly running into this type of stuff. Homicides, drive-by shootings by juveniles and stuff. And we have got to keep up, commissioners, with the manpower and necessities to protect our citizens. Okay, officer assaults. Since January 1st, 2024, we've had 18 additional assaults. That doesn't count the 34 assaults in 2023. I am tired of my officers getting assaulted in the detention center because we do not have the manpower that's supposed to be in there. We're supposed to have 24 people in the detention center, and you see some from a pre previous uh, things that I showed you. Sometimes we're operating with 8, 10, and 12, and we wonder why our officers are getting assaulted. We have three floors there. We have dangerous criminals in the detention center. And I do not want to have to bury one of my officers because we did not step up the plate and fund properly what we needed in that detention center. And I know you guys have an awesome responsibility, but for two years now, I have been raising cane about it. 2024 inmate bookings, intakes, 2,649. We released 2,703. Let me tell you something. We hold people that may not be guilty, but we hold some of the most vicious criminals that are walking our streets. Get a good example. The guy that shot the eight officers and killed four in Charlotte was arrested by us in 2012 with a felon for a felony possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, cocaine, and felony uh, to elude uh, arrest. That individual killed, I mean, four people and shot eight officers in Charlotte. Was that individual dealt with properly? If y'all could have seen his record... He should have never been on the streets of Alamance County or any other county in this nation. But he wasn't. But we're seeing today that our courts are getting more lenient. And we're having re-arrest, re-arrest, re-arrest. And eventually, these people are going to wind up killing another officer or another human being. Staffing issues. Since December 2023, this agent has encountered a number of staffing shortages due to the following. We had nine retirements, four terminations, 13 resignations, which puts us now 70 officers <coughs> short. It's outside and detention center. And folks, we cannot continue to operate uh, with that. Can't do it. Something has got to give. We have, uh, got a paper here, 70. We had 69 total and uh, officers and one animal control officer. So we have to look at all that and do it. But if we don't do something, I have suspended the Marshall contract, which brings in, brought in 2122, uh, $1,104,109 to Alamance County. Because of staffing shortages, in 2023, I had to back off holding these, and we brought in $708,991 to Alamance County. And we have already taken uh, $314,852, and I talked to the Marshal Service last week, and I explained to them we could no longer at this time hold any of their Marshal prisoners. Why Alamance County is so uh, lucrative for the Marshal Service, we're in between the federal courts in Greensboro, federal courts in Durham, federal courts in Winston-Salem. We're the ideal place for them to house these individuals. But we can no longer do it. We don't have the manpower, and you know we've got to do something. And I'm telling you, we have got to, I know you don't want me to say it, 
But unless y'all got a gold pot somewhere hid, you're going to have to raise some taxes. And when we look at the other counties we've been compared to for the last, I know, 23 years that I've been sheriff, Davidson and Randolph, and you see what their tax rate was and what our tax rate. I know you folks don't want to do that. But let me tell you something. My responsibility is to these people here, keeping them safe and their children safe and our schools safe. Consequences. Due to manpower issues, we have suspended U.S. Marshal contract. Shows you here uh, what money the county is going to be losing. And as you notice from 2022 to 2023, I cut back because we didn't have the manpower and we're continuing to lose the manpower uh, right now. Here, we're supposed to have 24 people on the floor. Y'all see some of this. This is rather new, too. We're supposed to have 24 officers working in the detention center. And these are that, where you see yellow, 13, 12, 11, and we have gone as low as 7 and 9. And let me tell you, that is totally suicidal for those officers in that detention center. Because uh, we've had two that have been beaten so badly, one can never work again, Alamance County Sheriff's Office, and one has been out for over a year. Can you imagine that medical bill and what the county's having to pay? Also, we have had to pay forcing officers in that detention center to come back in and work after working a 12-hour shift just to hit minimum level. And you know how much we have paid since July 1st, 2023 and April 30th, 2024 in overtime? $322,192. I sat and figured that. We have a total of 153 detention positions at given, say, a raise of $2,105.83 comes to $306,000. We could have given these officers in that detention center a little raise to help <coughs> keep these people here. We are at a critical level, commissioners, and to the citizens, very, very critical, to the point that if I have to, and I don't want to do this, I'm going to have to cancel our immigration uh, contract. And if I have to, I'm going to have to start farming our inmates to surrounding counties that have jail space, which means it's going to cost the heck out of us. It's just showing uh, July 1st through the whole year, the number where you see the yellow. We're supposed to have 24 officers, mm -hmm. folks, when you see that. Okay, now, you say, well, Sheriff, you know, uh, and y'all have, y'all have been fairly decent to the Sheriff's office over the years. The problem is, y'all are faced now with something past, I'm talking about years ago, commissioners kept kicking the can down the road. I remember they made a, a, a said we're going to give a, a certain percentage for the next three years. They did it first year in pay and canned it. Well, guess what? That throws us so far behind. But just recently, if you will look up here, our starting salary, 43104 and then there's a stipend there of five. But you go to look at Burlington's starting salary uh, right here is Officer 1, coming in with no experience whatsoever, $55,410.96. I mean, that's Burling. Go over here to Graham, $52,555.31. And look at their maximum here compared to ours. Now, if you was a young, young lady, let me ask you a question. Would you go to work for him if he was paying you seventy-five thousand, or would you go to work for me if I was paying you sixty-eight? Yeah, that's exactly right, <laughs> and, and and that is exactly what is happening, guys. We have got to get compatible. I'm talking about all emergency services in this county, not just the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. We've lost a lot. I will never forget. Never when I see these kids in here. The kids that was laying on that tarp when that school bus wrecked and took an hour and something to get an ambulance out of Chatham County and Orange County to take those kids to the hospital. We have an awesome responsibility 
as adults, especially elected officials. We have a responsibility to look after our citizens and our children. And sometimes it's not easy to make decisions, but we have got to do something because we're so far behind. And it's not all your fault. I want you to understand that. I'm not saying that because this has been a history of, I've been sheriff 23 years and it has been beating my head in every year trying to figure out what in the world we're going to do. And it's, it's ridiculous to have to do that. Okay, thank you. Now, why, what is the problem by not having enough staffing? First of all, serious injury to personnel and even detainees, which will bring a lawsuit on the good old sheriff here in Alamance County. Damage to the facilities. We've had our facilities tore up for an officer to get there. It cost several thousands of dollars. Uh, they flooded... Um, my death 16 times from the, the <laughs> commodes over top the, in the thing running down on my desk and out in the front where you come in. I can testify it wasn't pretty. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It didn't smell good either. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. Okay. But we also, we're having employee burnout. When you go home, got something planned with your family, and the phone rings, and it's your, the lieutenant on, you say, hey, got to come in, buddy. Got to come in. We need you right now. We don't have enough to even do anything here in the detention center. You have to turn around and come back in. You're going to have burnout, and they can't take time off to be with their family members. They can't plan nothing. I sure can't plan nothing. My wife tell you that. She's sitting right over there. But you know what? I asked for this job. Cannot take uh, time off for family vacation. Not able to do duties assigned because having to help directly with the detainees. Every of the 24 officers, every one of them has a responsibility they're supposed to do in that jail and a lot are detention center. A lot of times they can't do it because they're having to do other things. And we get inspected about eight times a year by the state of North Carolina and the, the U.S. Marshal Service and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And that jail has to be spotless or you get written up. And we hadn't been written up last time. Family problems because of a tired and stressed employee. I can tell you, uh, you know, my wife can sense when I'm ill and she stays away from me when I get home, stressed out. Sometimes I go run, sometimes I, you know, mow the yard five times in one standing, but, you know, get it out of you. But these things have got to stop. Not able to attend children's functions because of working and call back in. Think about your children, you commissioners. Think about it. How would you not be able to go watch your kid play basketball or your child cheerlead? Right now on patrol, we're, we're supposed to have 13 on outside deputies, 13 outside deputies on a shift. We're lucky to run seven and six. You have sickness, you have training, mandatory training the state requires, and then you have vacation. What does that do? I'm telling you what it does. It call, when an officer calls for help and you only got six officers there, 435 miles to cover in this county to respond. What worries me more than anything, you are going to fly from one end of the county to another and you're going to wind up killing a citizen in a wreck. But when we have a full shift, you've got two people and a lieutenant and a sergeant is in the districts that that won't happen. But when you don't have them, there's not a whole lot you can do. We're experiencing, like I said, more violent crimes than ever in our county. Why? Because we don't have the manpower out there to be seen. A patrol car, I tell my people, if you've got to sit and do, and but when you're short, you have twice as many calls you've had to answer that night, guess what? I require that report be done before you leave your shift. So what do they do? They'll go sit in a high crime area and try to do their reports from the previous calls just to get caught up. I would rather for my people to be able to patrol, move around, check the stores, let people see you, 
Because if you're going to break in a home and you see a deputy every 30 minutes, bro, you ain't going to hit that house. You're going to go somewhere where you never see a deputy. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. L look at our comparative pay. I ask you, please, we have got to do something. And it is an awesome responsibility to sit in those chairs. I wouldn't want to sit in those chairs. But I can tell you, we both, Sheriff and y'all, took an oath to look after the people of our county and follow the Constitution of North Carolina and the United States. I'm asking you to do that. Commissioners, I cannot any longer stand by and let officers become targets of attacks and endangerment from the criminal element in this county and those that are coming out of this county into this county. I'm begging you to step up, do what you're elected to do, and that is to give our agency the necessary monies to run our detention center and monies necessary to enforce the laws of our land to keep our citizens, employees, and communities safe. I took an oath of office to do that. I need your help in getting that done. And if you don't uh, think that uh, my officers work, I ask you, come and crawl in a car with them. Just for a 12-hour shift, come and call, uh, crawl in a car with them, and you'll see what they're encountering. I know uh, 4310, uh, we have 21 people. That's our outside uh, deputies. 21 total people, 18 all sworn officers and three civilians openings. Let me tell you something. That's a lot of people. 4320, which is our detention center, 49 total openings. And we're supposed to protect these people when we can't put these officers on the road I'm not getting on you, commissioners. I appreciate every single thing you do. But there comes a time where we're going to have to pay the piper, and that time is now. I don't think we can wait any longer because what's going to happen if we're not careful? We're going to wind up with offer officers getting killed, like in Charlotte. Officers doing something or trying to get to a call, wind up in a wreck and getting killed or killing a citizen. Folks, this is important. And I can sit here and talk to you all night long, but until y'all sit down and make up your mind what, we, we, what you're going to do, uh, we're going to continue to do the best we can. But I'm telling you, we have a responsibility to protect these people right here and their children. And right now, we have been extremely lucky that we have not got an officer killed. We've had uh, a citizen or two that's been shot because of their actions. But had we not had proper uh, officers there, we'd probably have a dead officer. Guys, if it means raising, I don't like paying taxes. I can tell you, I don't like paying taxes. But if it means y'all having to raise taxes, put it on the sheriff. I got proof here what is needed, folks. And not, and like I say, it's not just us. I'll never forget. I, I dream about the wreck of that bus on Highway 87 and those kids crying, laying on a tarp. And we didn't have manpower enough to... Uh, in our uh, EMTs and ambulances to be able to respond. Had to call Orange and Chatham County. Now, if you was a parent, I want to ask this question, if you was a parent and it was your child, how would you feel? You'd be pretty ill, wouldn't you? I was, and I didn't even have a child there. The people of Alamance County, I'm sure, don't want a tax increase but they know it's going to be necessary. We are growing, and we must keep up with the growth with our emergency service, not just the sheriff's office. It is not an easy job to make a decision in a commissioner's seat. But there comes a time 
where you got to look in the mirror and say we've got to do it. And I'm telling you, that time is here as far as I'm concerned for Alamance County. I was born and raised here. I want the best for Alamance County. And y'all can give it to us, but it's going to take some headaches. I appreciate your time tonight. I hope you'll listen to what i got to say because I do not want to, to uh, you know, have to bring people out to courthouses to put on the road our, our uh, security in the courthouses. I don't want to have to bring, you know, people uh, from the courtrooms. Law says all i got to do is put one, one deputy in the courtroom. That's what the law says. And I don't want to be dragging them out when... Y'all have to turn around and hire a big security firm paying a whole lot more than what it would take to maintain our officers. We have good officers here, commissioners, caring officers here. I ask you for your help. Thank you very much. County manager, uh, we have a pay study. Uh, phase one has been completed and as a result of phase one, what action do we county commissioners take? We increase salaries for detention, correct? Correct. You increase the detention salaries to bring them up to a market level and make them competitive. All right. And in phase two, when will that go into place? We are proposing in next year's budget for phase two to be implemented similar to this year, January 1 of next year. And we would anticipate that the sheriff's office would be part of phase two. All right. Thank you. We've, I've been told we are taking a recess for 10 minutes. <laughs> We're in recess for 10 minutes. We're back in session. Okay. We are now at 7B on our agenda. That is follow up on commercial property appraisals and Ms. Atkins. It's actually new 7C. Well, I didn't read that one. You have to see that. Oh, yeah. Let's see if that works. Good evening, board. Thank you for having me here this evening. I'd like to present to you a follow-up on our commercial property appraisals. Closer this, to the mic. <coughs> closer to the mic. I'm, I'm a bit soft-spoken. Is that better? Yeah, much better. Okay. Uh, so I'm presenting a follow-up on our commercial property appraisals. Uh, this uh, references the 10 big box retail stores uh, that we've been talking about recently. And the results are in. So we contracted with Newmark Valuation and Advisory Services review the value of the 10 big box stores the county had concerns about. The work was performed by two MAI appraisers. This is the gold standard for this sort of assignment. And the results may be summarized as follows. Of the 10 values under review, five were determined to be correct. And I was very happy with this. Uh, they expressed that they were impressed. Uh, county tax offices are not always so accurate, and they were very happy to see these five were on the mark. Two showed a small amount of variance. Um, in my world, though, appraisals are opinions of value, and so you're going to have some variation. That's not very concerning. Three showed a significant amount of variance. And so we're, we're not surprised. We suspected that may be the case. The average percentage of variance was 15%, and the total amount of the variance was $14,932,801. So this represents a potential underassessment. And I want to focus on potential, because we, we need to talk about what that is. We'll kind of come back to that in a minute. But first, I want to put this in perspective. We need to get a sense of the scale that we're working with. Because $14.9 million sounds like a lot of money to me. But relative to our tax base at $25.3 billion is actually a very small amount. So 
that works out to 0.06 percent. That's not six percent. That's not six tenths of a percent. That is six hundredths of one percent. <laughs> and I have a very hard time visualizing. Well, what what is that? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And I'm a visual learner, so this is an illustration. This is a graph showing 25.3 billion. This is our tax base. And if you graph the 14.9 million side by side, there it is. Your eyes do not deceive you. you. You can't see any portion of the bar graph because Excel can't render it. You can see the dollar figure. Excel can, can put a label on it, but it cannot render any portion of the blue bar to, to show side by side because 14.9 million is so small relative to 25.3 billion that it just doesn't graph. So that might give you some perspective on, on the scale of the situation. Another thing that might be useful is to think about this in terms of pennies on the tax rate. Because one of the concerns I've heard is, well, did this affect the tax rate that the commissioner has put in place? Might we have gotten a different tax rate had these been valued differently? Well, a penny equates to $2.5 million, roughly. The amount we're talking about at the current tax rate will produce $64,500 of annual revenue. So that is the portion of a penny that that represents. That's not a penny. It's not a half. It's not a quarter. Right? It is a very tiny sliver of a penny. But at least we can see this one because we couldn't see the other one with the bar chart. So we can see it in this context. Um, another way to think about it, because even then I have difficulty grappling with what does that mean to me, is the impact to the average homeowner. So in Alamance County, the median home value is $263,997. If I'm the median homeowner, then if we could apply that to a tax rate, if we could, we would adjust the tax rate by 0 0.000-2568 per $100. For the average homeowner, that's 68 cent per year. Now that's not 68 cent on the tax rate. That is literally 68 cents. Reach into your pocket, pull out some change, and that is the impact on that taxpayer each year. So that helps me to kind of picture what the scale of the situation is. Now, I say that, but we have to talk about hypothetical versus real impact. This is a hypothetical impact. But if you look at our current tax rate, 43.2 cents. Um, I, I've got the records going back to the late 30s. Alamance County has never split a penny before. We've always had even cents for our tax rate. We just round the nearest penny. Going to 43.2 is a new thing for us. Uh, but, but there's a limit, I think, on how much we're reasonably willing to round. Again, at the potential impact, the maximum possible impact of this scenario, if we were to try to capture that, we would have to add four decimal places to the end of our tax rate. And I just don't think that the, the county board is going to do that. So whether these values are as they are or as they potentially may need to be, I think it would come out in the rounding. I think that we would not end up with a tax rate of 0.4322568. I, I just don't think that would happen. And when you round, the impact is zero dollars. It's so small that rounding it eliminates it. So hypothetically, we're talking about 68 cent per year, possibly, to the median homeowner. But in real terms, we're talking zero cents. In real terms, I do not think that will move a tax rate. And so the average homeowner hasn't been affected one way or the other as far as their tax bill. County revenues have obviously been impacted, but that individual tax bill has not been impacted. Now I want to talk about potential briefly. So I keep saying potential, and why do I say potential? So just because an appraiser determines a given value does not mean that we would be able to assess the property for that value. Right? I can put a number on it, but that doesn't mean that's the number it will have. The appeal process would likely introduce competing appraisals at much lower values. 
So at the end of the day, an appeals board would have to receive, they would receive credible reports from credible appraisers indicating very different values, and they would be called upon to determine which is correct. So when you've got these credible reports from these credible appraisers, what are you going to do? There's a high likelihood that neither of the appraised values would be chosen, <coughs> but that some middle ground would be chosen. And so really, the final value that would be in place isn't whatever I say it is. It's whatever an appeals board ultimately says it is. Now, you might assume that we would meet in the middle of our current assessment and the higher value found by Newmark, effectively cutting the $14.9 million figure in half. Now, if we did that, the impact of the median homeowner of $0.68 cent annually would be uh, reduced to $0.34 cent annually, right? That might be the case. We, we might meet in the middle. But it's possible that the competing appraisal could be lower than our starting point or higher than our starting point. So it's possible that number could be lower, it could be higher, and it's not just a matter of splitting the difference. The more convincing argument is going to pull towards whatever direction it's in. So if we put on a better argument, it might shift towards us. If they put on a better argument, it might shift towards them. There's just no way to know what that appeals board is going to rule. So when I'm reporting the numbers, I'm reporting the, the full potential, the 14.9. Um, but just because that's the potential, I don't think that's a realistic number because I think there's going to be compromise. I think half that much might be realistic, but it could be none. The, the situation is that when you take it before that appeal board, we may have ended up at the exact position we're in right now. We just would have done it the right way by the book instead of kind of skipping that board and ending up where we are today. But for all I know, we're in the same place we would have been to, stop, to start with. I just don't know what an appeal board would rule. So, all right, that's, that's the scale of, of what we're dealing with. What if we wanted to pursue? We want to proceed forward and see if we can recapture and bring that in. So an optimistic scenario, and I've worked with the county attorney. Um, on my side, I'm looking at it from the, the real property side, but obviously there's a lot of legal defense that would have to take place going through the appeals boards. Allowing for legal fees and additional employment of experts, we think optimistically we might get 25000 paid over a three-year period. That That's something that we may be able to net. Uh, that's $8,300 per year. Now, again, putting that in, in perspective, the average homeowner then would see 26 cent after the three-year period of recapture. That's nine cents per year. That's not nine cents on the tax rate. That's nine literal pennies. That would be the annual benefit that optimistically the average homeowner may see. Um, but there is a pessimistic scenario, right? It's possible that our expenses, especially our legal fees, would exceed our revenues. And in that case, the county could engage in a multi-year battle and receive a net loss. We really don't know what happens until it's tried. Um, the scenario changes if we do this through revaluation. One of our issues is that we've already put a value out there and then we're going to turn around and counter that value and fight from that position. That's not a great position to fight from. Revaluation, you, you have the high ground, so to speak. You're starting fresh. We've got the information in from these appraisals, and then we would be able to place a fresh value. Our next revaluation is scheduled for 2027. Work on that revaluation is starting this July. So another avenue is just to say, well, it's a relatively small impact. Three years from now, we'll have new values in place, informed by what we have. And, and sure, at our last revaluation in 2017, we fought them at the Property Tax Commission in Raleigh. They appealed then. They're going to appeal next time. That, that's just the nature of this. But our ground is so much more firm when we're starting fresh than when we've already put a value out there and we're trying to come back and counter that value. I can't tell the board what the right answer is. I don't think the board has to make a decision today what the right answer is. Uh, but I do want you to be informed 
here's the scale, here's the, the scenarios, uh, so that you can give it consideration. Um, any questions? Mr. What's, Sir. What's the, um, what did you say was the amount of tax revenue that we are giving up by under <coughs> $14 million over 10 properties, $65,000 a year? Yeah, so it's uh, 64500 annual. And that assumes we could recapture it full. Full. So if we met in the middle, we're talking about 32000 a year. So if we spent 64500 in legal fees at, at the <laughs> administrative office of the courts battling this and end right. up with a valuation that we agree is right, we're breaking even. And, and that's the and issue. That's, and that's assuming that we win. Yeah, and that's the issue. So if, if, if there's 64000 out there, but we could meet them in the middle at 32000 when the smoke clears, but then we've got to spend 24000 in legal defense, we walk away with eight <coughs> annual revenue, which is what we're looking at optimistically. Why were these 10 properties chosen to look at in the first place? So these were the 10 that were appraised in the same methodology, um, which is that they were all assessed at uh, 65, 66 dollars per square foot which was perfectly appropriate for five of them not bad for two but was inappropriate for for three of them and of course lowe's was called to our attention that that kind of began the the research and all 10 were affected this is the universe of what was affected nothing but these 10 were approached in that way is there okay is there any reason to suspect is there any credible evidence to suspect that any other commercial property was appraised wrongly. No. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Jim. Mr. Hobson. How long have we been doing it this way? What do you mean? How long have we been doing this right for the commercial? Like, has this been a standard year? Do that do that amount next and focus a lot on the residential? Because, I mean, I'm in an area here that I'm just sure. asking you what I think I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing you say there were 10 properties, mm -hmm. which there are not just 10 properties in Alamance County. Right, sure. And I'm hearing you say this certain amount that we would get if we go to court and talk about it with lawyers that we may not win. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't think we should cave to anything because our residential folks have paid a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't know what all these other properties are, but I think if all of these commercial properties had been valued, we might be a way ahead on the game when it comes to things that we could help with other parts of our county that are in such crisis with their buildings. You know, I, I don't mean to bring this up early, but I remember when I used to work with sexual assault, my husband was an assistant DA, and he would say, we're going to take a plea mm -hmm. because we don't think we can win it, but we're going to take a plea to get something. And I'm, the lawyers are going to lose it right here. And I would go, you know what? That plea does not change anything that happened to that victim. Mm -hmm. Win or lose, you can't go back and change that. Mm -hmm. But if that victim knows you are fighting for them, win or lose, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, I think whatever we need to do for our county to be fair mm -hmm. among whoever can't pay, who can pay, and who should pay, mm -hmm. that's what we need to do. Because if we start the look of we give all these massive incentives mm -hmm. to these industries because that's part of that game that you do because you want to court them and you mm -hmm. want them to come here, jobs, the whole nine yards. But if we give them incentives at that part and then we may not assess them at the right level and then we complain about our teachers and their supplements, I think that's kind of screwed up. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure, and this is so not my thing, but all I'm hearing is we're willing to not go to war for this. And I know we can't go backwards, mm -hmm. but we sure can go forward from this on. We have to pay money to do this reveal. Mm -hmm. So that's more money that we got to put into it. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want it to be fair for everybody, mm -hmm. no matter who you are or what you are. I'm thankful you come here and make Elements County your home if you're a business, but you need to pay your fair share. It's kind of like tithing. Mm -hmm. We tithe at church because Duke Power doesn't donate the light bill. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to. And I think it's real important that we do this for our county. I don't want this county to be known as go home and build there. You'll get a big old cut. You know, the rest of everybody else will pay it for you. No, because uh, I appreciate businesses, but we make businesses a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's why they come here and we support them. And they need to turn around and support their county and their tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So this is not my gift, but I'm, I just want, I know fairness is, mm -hmm. and that's, I'm not hearing it. Mm -hmm. And I know this is, this is your kind of talk, Jeremy. You're way over my head. But I just, um, 
I don't know, this uh, this uh, bothers me, but, and it has from the very beginning. We just don't have 10 big commercial properties. Mm -hmm. You know, I had the mayor of Graham ask me a question about it, and I said, that's a question for my tax director. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, Jennifer's smart with this, too. Mm -hmm. I just want it to be fair mm -hmm. because um, this, this part of the tax game could take the load off other things that we could put into making our buildings better, mm -hmm. our law enforcement have the right amount mm -hmm. they need. It could really fund a lot of things that we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. One person can't pay it all, mm -hmm. but we all can pay something. Mm -hmm. And that's my little nothing opinion, but mm -hmm. I don't like this. Mm -hmm. I know you know it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, and I would say, you know, out of 6,000 properties, only three so far have been indicated to be problematic at all. And, and I would point that out. There were 10 properties with a similar approach out of thousands of properties. And seven out of the 10 are fine. Yeah. Only three of them aren't. So, you know, it, it, it's a situation you're looking at, at those three. And then the question is, do you pursue them or not? And I can't tell you, is our value any different today than it would have been had we done it differently because again we're at the mercy of appeals boards but if we're successful it's a very small amount of money if we're not successful it could be negative revenue so again from my perspective as as tax administrator i like things to be done by the book i'm a procedures guy every dollar is important to me but from your seat as the county commission acting in the best interest of the citizens and that's where you have to decide what what is important? What do you, what do you want to do with it, Mr. Carter? Well, I appreciate you presenting the information to us, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of aligned a little bit with Pam on this because I I want us to be fair too. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a tried and tried expression about being on the horns of a dilemma. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we spend the money to try and get the money and then mm -hmm. lose the money? Mm -hmm. Do we spend the money and get it? How long do you think it would take us to process <laughs> this if we went through the process of trying to proceed after these? So we, we've got appeals that were filed last year that are at the state level that are still pending. And so I would think that, you know, within a year's time, they might be ready to begin hearing the appeals. So sometime in 25, maybe sometime in 26, we might be down to Raleigh. And then it's what we, where we go from there. And I would defer to the county attorney at, at that point. That's kind of outside of my expertise. I do know that there are counties that will go in for year after year, you know, five years deep and longer. Beg pardon? Five years deep and longer. It's a multi-year process to get to it. So if we were to win on the appeal, would we would, would the funds be provided retroactively? Oh, certainly. Now, if, if we resolved everything and the time had already passed, those funds would be due, I would presume that they would then pay those funds. I, I have no doubt that they will pay whatever amount comes out at the end of the day, and, and, and promptly that's our experience. <coughs> so you're saying five years? I have no idea. It could be less. We might spend as more. much as it would take to get it, or we might get. We'll spend this much. And on a, <laughs> starting up for reval. All right. Uh, odds are very good the reval will be done before this is resolved. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carter, that's a fair assessment in my Beg view. Pardon? That's a fair assessment in my view as well. Um, so there, are, the Property Tax Commission is, is hearing cases with, um, year numbers that are several years in the past and the way it would work we would reassess um, we'd send them basically a new bill they'd have a new opportunity to appeal at the local level we'd, we'd defend there and then they might appeal to the state so the process would be protracted it wouldn't be immediate um, and I think Mr. Akins is correct it's very likely we'd be done with the next reval cycle before we had any answers on whether or not we'd get any increased revenue from this cycle I noted um, that Mr. Turner and I both were shaking our heads mm -hmm. when you were talking about attorney fees. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not cheap. Uh, <laughs> staff cannot do these appeals. Um, so you are required to hire outside counsel. And we're, we're talking about spending at a minimum 
five, ten million bucks. Uh, what? It, no. Yeah, at some point, potentially, or say it's five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, we still have lost the game financially. And I agree, it was not billions, it's thousands. Uh, I stand corrected. Uh, but it doesn't make any sense when we have a new reveal starting mm -hmm. roughly January 1st mm -hmm. or July 1st mm -hmm. of this year. Right. Uh, we're going to be reappraising all of those properties, mm -hmm. all 10 that you spent the time mm -hmm. and money sure. to reappraise. Mm -hmm. uh, and before anything else can happen, we're on the new rate, new appraisal, uh, and we suspect as the county, we'll do it a little differently for sure. commercial properties the next mm -hmm. go-round. Mm -hmm. It'll cost us a lot more money right. to do the new procedure, mm -hmm. but I think it'll make citizens much happier. Mm -hmm. And I agree with everybody sitting here. Uh, we want to be fair to everyone, mm -hmm. but we have to be smart on how we spend the money. Mm -hmm. And if you spend a ton of money in legal fees, you might win, you might lose, mm -hmm. but it's much smarter to wait on the reappraisal, mm -hmm. which we now have gone to four years, mm -hmm. not eight years. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very, very smart move on this board's part. Mm -hmm. We thank you. Thank you. The next item on the printed agenda is 7C. Um, and Ms. Evans? Yeah. Good evening, up. Commissioners. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, what I wanted to bring before you all to discuss tonight would be with our upcoming bond sale, the county intends to issue par amount of $19.5 million. We are slated for an LGC bond sale on May 29th, and we would have cash in hand on June 18th. What I'd like to bring before the board is for us to discuss accepting all premium that we possibly could. Um, again, these are just estimated numbers. We would not know what a bidder would be offering in premium until those bids are captured by the LGC on the 29th and submitted by those um, bidders. But what we could possibly see is about $2 million of additional money that we could receive in premium. And what that would allow us to do, as you can see from up on the screen, we have slated projects of $20.8 million. This would allow us to continue the momentum on those HVAC and roofing projects and keep those going. And for the audience, explain where these bond monies go. What? Sure. So these would be to the different um, schools that you see up on the screen. Um, so we would have Southern Alamance High School, HVAC, Hall River Elementary School with HVAC, B. Everett Jordan. Uh, we previously funded the roofing. If you'll remember, that was about $1.2 million. We were able to move some money around and go ahead and get that one um, underway this fiscal year. But they do need an additional $320,000 for HVAC, Western Middle Roof 2.8, Western High 3.5, Eastern High 4.8, South Mebane Elementary 1 million, Southern Alamance, the middle school, the gym only 600000 um, then back for HVAC projects at Alexander Wilson of 320000 Hillcrest and Smith, 700000 Alexander Wilson, uh, phase one of a roofing would be 737000 um, which brings our total to $20.8 million, and that is just for the top priorities. There is an additional school listed on the second page, Bruce. Um, so with additional funds, we could possibly go ahead and get the design work underway for the EM Holt Elementary HVAC needs of $2.7 million. Now, this does not include all the monies that have already been set aside for ABSS, the school system. That is correct. For example, as of 2022, we set aside $5 million for roofing for Graham High School, an additional $5 million as of 2022 for um, Southern High School, if I remember correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. And none of these monies have been expended 
by the school board. Is that correct? So from what I understand is that those project those projects are still under design, and we may have actually received um, a couple of invoices for the Graham High Roof. All right. I would have to verify that. But I know that those projects are underway. But basically $10 million is already sitting out there to be used by the school board, <coughs> and they did not enter any contracts for either school until within the last 30 days. Is that correct? I would have to verify that with Greg Hook. I'm not aware of that. All right. I know they were submitting bids. I don't know that they accepted any. The point being, we give them the money and they sit on it. And I don't approve of that. Um, it's like the gym, the bleachers at Cummings High School. You know, those money should have been spent. We give it to the school system and they sit on the projects. And I just don't like it. By the way, uh, Mr. Lashley talked to me on the way home from the hospital today. He says he will be at our next meeting. Uh, he plans to meet with our county manager uh, later this week to go over our proposed budget. We could not wait on the school system, by the way, for our budget. So we already have a budget uh, that's been proposed and the county commissioners are looking at it. We simply couldn't wait on the school system. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are. But I want the citizens to know that we can give them the money. We cannot make them do the work. Uh, Dr. Harrison asked me not to beat up on him anymore, and I'm afraid I just did. Sorry. Um, at, at the last meeting or meeting before at ABSS, um, Greg Hooks, their Graham High School stuff's on the way. It's supposed to be the materials on site in June to start. So Graham High School's off the the list, so to speak. Um, and and just once again, the bleachers. I don't want this to be another dead horse to beat. Were not being considered. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. We've just heard about this this year. So um, there's many other things that we're needing to do, but the bleachers, unfortunately, weren't talked about because I guess between all the other stuff, I hear Eastern's got issues too with some of the areas in their bleachers. It's Everybody's got issues because everything's old. It's wore out. So um, the bleachers, is that's going to be something and getting stuff ordered. I mean, for football season, you know, a couple months ago I asked about starting on that earlier, and um, it's just not going to work out. But that was not even thought about in the bond whenever we were looking at all the planning of it. That would have been nice if it was, but it just wasn't. There was so many things way in front of it. But that wasn't even considered because who knew the bleachers were in such bad shape. I'm just glad they discovered it and nobody's been hurt from them. That's the important thing. Ms. Thompson, I totally agree. Yeah. We talked about in our oversight committee these bleachers more than once. Well, see, we um, don't get to go to the oversight committee, so I don't know what you talk about in it. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to attending that meeting one of these days, so I won't sound like I don't know about it because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Turner. Ms. Evans, what uh, interest rate are we expecting to receive when we go to the bond market in a couple weeks? Uh, so preliminary estimates that I've received have been around about 3.5%. Um, again, we won't know what the actual interest rate will be until those bids are received by the LGC because those it is a competitive bid process. The model we use for projections estimates 5%? That's correct. Um, if we get the additional two around $2 million, mm -hmm. um, is there sufficient revenue into the debt service model to get the additional money without having to put additional tax revenue into it? There is. Okay, thank you. There is. With the model being at 5%, it, the interest well covers what we would repay for the premium. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Well, uh, Pam is fond of talking about ferries. <laughs> She's so broke. She's off Our that ferry road. is totally She's broke, totally I tell you. Broke. Um, when you look at what we spend for everything we touch today, it's getting outrageous. I mean, mm -hmm. I, folks in the audience, I know you go to the grocery store, you go to buy a, a wardrobe. If you've got three or four youngsters and somebody's got three out, four out here, <laughs> I guarantee you we're keeping them in clothes and shoes is not cheap. 
But it, you, you look at that and you talk about what we pay for uh, rebar and concrete and what we pay for concrete and what we pay for um, steel in a structure. I mean, I've watched the construction, pro three construction projects going up and working on a, or two that have been completed and one going up now for the college. Every bit of that has gone up in price. Our cost of the Public Safety Training Center doubled while we were trying to get through the process of negotiating the land. Um, every bit of this is not cheap. And if we can come out of this without having to raise taxes on something with the money we've budgeted and have the money to get part of, the, part of some more work done without having to impact our citizens, I think that's a good idea. Our citizens, November um, 2018, voted on a bond for ABSS of $150 million. That did not include this premium or extra monies. Um, I've heard Ms. Thompson, Bill Lashley, and myself all three say, and I think I've heard you guys at some point saying, $150 million is what it is. We should not be adding taxpayer monies for premiums beyond the amount voted on. So, yeah, I, I'm at a point, don't do the premium. Let's give them what the tax citizens voted for, which is $150 million. So we have issued... If you're talking on a cash basis, we have already received that cash of 150 million. Um, where the 19.5 million, where that money is derived from, is because we accepted premium. We did not have to issue the entire par amount, so we still have the they're authorized, but they are unissued of this 19.5 million. This will allow us to fund the projects for the roof and the HVAC systems that were identified by the joint study that the county performed for county bu buildings as well as the school facilities. Um, these bonds would not be able to pay for any county projects because they are voted for for school projects. So we would follow the bond question that was on the ballot back in 2018 and we would be able to complete these projects. And also by accepting the premium, then we're also able to use some of that premium, about $300,000 of it, to pay for the issuance cost of the bonds versus having to take that then off of the proceeds of 19.5. So we would then be delaying future pro more projects from the priority list that the board received earlier this year. But we still got to pay the extra $19 million back. We do, but because of the, mo the way that the model was, was formatted, um, we were anticipating 5% of interest. Um, right now, the bond market has not gotten to that 5%. So with the tax rate that was increased back at the beginning of the bonds when we sold them in 2021, of the board remembers there was an upfront tax increase there. Combine that with the state lottery funds that are used for debt service, as well as the dedicated sales tax, Article 40 and 42, Right now, these funds would be covered, this debt service payment would be covered without any additional tax increase to the, to the citizens. And if the board will remember, during the, pro, uh, during the budget process last year, a penny was actually cut from the plan. So even with that penny removed and reapportioned over to the county budget, there is still adequate funding that would pay the debt service for these projects and allow us to move forward with the roofing and HVAC needs. Mr. Yes. Chairman, the result is going to be that we're going to, this is work we've got to do. We're going to have to find a way to pay for it. We either will not be raising taxes to pay for it or use this source, which won't cause us to have to pay, raise taxes to pay for it. You still got to pay it back. Got but we don't have to back. raise taxes to pay it back. Right. We would have to raise taxes to pay for this work. There is. We financed it. There are adequate revenues right now that flow through the model that will fund the plan. Um, and with the bond sales that was done back in the referendum that was processed back in fiscal year um, November 2018, the board has seven years to issue that debt. 
So come November 2025, if we have not issued this $19.5 million, it will just go away. The authorization would not be there unless this board so chose to ask for a three-year extension. So can I just ask a question? So you're telling me that they are done at 150. This is like this extra money that, okay. Yes. Mr. We know that we're gonna have, we have needs and it's, we, this is a tool that the county can use to go ahead and issue this debt, keep these projects moving, keep those capital improvement projects, get them completed so that we're not having to go back through a mold issue again. Um, or we, we table everything, cancel the bond sale, and would have to look at another way to fund it. So issuing another bond referendum or issuing an installment loan. It's a tool here in the present that we can go ahead and utilize and get these projects completed. And Stan, I'm not against issuing mm -hmm. the bond that's already been authorized. I'm against authorizing the premium and costing the taxpayers to pay. Call it whatever you like. It, we may have it in our budget now, but we still got to spend the money and pay it back. And we've got to look after our tax payers. You folks that are having trouble buying groceries and clothes, you're the ones that are going, and I, as a taxpayer, are going to be paying this back. So could I put this in perspective for the board? Um, is So if we were to accept the premium, if we were to accept the premium on current estimates, and please remember, we have not received bids, so I don't know exactly how much premium is going to be offered. This is just rough estimates that we've received from the most current um, bond sales that other counties or municipalities have, have had. Um, so if I'm comparing where we think debt service payments would be if we accepted every penny of, of premium to the bond, if we were to adjust it down and not accept any premium, um, in the first year, the difference between those two payments is $155,000. Right now, within our budget, because of the dedicated revenues, we have dedicated revenues that would be transferred to ABSS Capital Reserves at the end of the fiscal year of about $1.5 million. The county cannot spend those funds on any other projects than a school project or a debt service. So the revenues are there of that $1.5 million that would offset the $155 thousand that we're looking would be the first year of debt service payment. Mr. Chairman, if I might. I, um, I, when, we, when we first issued the, the bonds, I was one of the ones on this board saying that we should issue only $150 million because that's what the voters approved. And I believe that then and I, I wish that we could do that now. Um, but we funded a study coming out of the mold crisis, cost seven hundred, roughly $700,000 to look at every roof and every HVAC and ABSS uh, and to find out where we have the most needs. And we know that for these schools on this list, there are active roof leaks. And we know that HVACs in these schools on the list are, are insufficient to cool or heat the facility in order to keep moisture from continuing to form. Susan, we go to the next slide. And if we accept only $19.5 million, uh, then Smith's not going to get, uh, can you go back? Yeah. Smith's not going to get an HVAC. Alexander Wilson's not going to get a new roof. Uh, and Beaver Jordan, I think it was, is not going to get a new HVAC. I can't tell the kids in those schools that they shouldn't have that when we have focused on the problem, we have come up with a potential solution to fund the problem, and we have the means to do it without additional revenues going in. Yes, it's going to cost more. I understand that. But we have an obligation to keep moisture from forming in these schools. This is the solution that we have available to us, and therefore I make a motion that we fund the 19.5 plus the premium uh, and the bond issues. Mr. Chairman, as well, you look down that list to the right-hand column, HVAC issues. Part of the problem we're having right now, part of the problem we're facing with ABSS is the increase in their utility cost from having to run their systems 
24 hours a day, 12 months a year, and inefficient HVAC systems are not going to save them money. If we need to replace them and get more efficient systems in, I can guarantee you as old as a lot of these are, they're very inefficient, I'm confident. We can save money on our utility expense, which we have to fund for ABSS as well, or which they're going to need us to fund. It's a bill they've got to pay, unless we want to be dealing with mold again. Um, and after that school, that second school, that second page school, E.M. Holt, is another whole list of schools. That is not just going to just make ABSS all rainbows. That's correct. That the whole system is just a hot mess. It just is because of neglect and not funding and not whatever when it comes to our buildings. And, um, and got to have the right people in the right positions doing the right choices and making these decisions. It's got to be right. Um, you know, I, the whole time I've said that I wasn't going to go uh, past the bond because the citizens like myself voted. This bond is paid. It's like a coupon book you used to get when you trade cars. We all got one, and it's to pay for this. And if I really thought that this was going to fix all the problems and we were just done, hey, I'd just say go for it. But we need much bigger than this. And, and we're going to have to look at that because everywhere you go, there is some kind of need that we've got because time has just run out. We're looking at what the sheriff has come in here for. We're looking at EMS. We're, look, we're looking at all that, which we, you know, what you said, Sheriff, everybody wants to come here. But we got to pay for it because some people come here to do harm. They don't come here to plant flowers. And you got to have make sure you got all that. It's just so much that's hitting us all at one time. It is just the mother of all times to get things right. And, um, you know, my word is everything. I just, I, I, I swore that I was not going to go past the 150 because I don't think this is the issue to fix our school systems. I think this is just a dent. A dent. I'm sick of dents. I am sick of dents because when, when we used to paint schools every six years, we tried to do a rotation of six to seven schools. And by that six year, you would be painting that six year ago because paint can make a big difference. But we've had some really, you know, just wait to my board comments. We've had some issues with painting companies. We've had some issues with custom. We've had some issues with stuff because for some reason, schools, we just have to get whoever can do whatever and just pay a whole lot of money. That just cannot keep going on. We don't run our households that way. And we can't run an education because you know who gets messed up is teachers and kids. The whole time we were at ABSS fighting over mold because that's what it was like WWE wrestling, literally. Not anything was mentioned about children or teachers. And they've, they've all been in here begging us to help them, save our positions, do this, because I know the positions that they're losing and they're going to need them. They really are because kids just don't come to school nowadays. They come with a whole bunch of baggage because of what they're coming out of at their home. We can't ignore them like that doesn't exist. But it's just money, money, money. And, and I think, well, all this right here, is this going to fix all of our problems? No. Um, did I take an oath? to work for this county, work hard, and not go past a certain amount that everybody went to the polls to vote for? Did we do the tax, quarter cent tax? Boy, that would have helped a lot, wouldn't it? <laughs> but shoulda, coulda, woulda, that's done. So, you know, Lord have mercy, John, we're gonna agree. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But I, I can't go past that, and I understand why you're doing it. I agree with both sides, I really do, but I'm going to stick by what I've said the whole time. I've given Mr. Cole a hard time every time he comes in here with Davenport. And I, this is not, we are, we're band-aiding. We have got to think big picture to do something that's going to fix our school as a system. Because if we don't, we're going to be doing this rotating recidivism, going through that door constantly all the time, and we're never going to see anything really finished at the same time. Never. So you, what you're saying is you would like to take this money, this cost, and put it off until I'm we can saying, figure out how we're going to pay for we've it. We've already we've already approved a bond issuance. Yeah, yeah, I know. We've already approved a bond issuance. I know. Yeah. It's going to the to the bond market in May. Well, we can't. We're not. Y'all got the vote. I'm just. I just. I can't. Well, the vote is on the premium only. Right. I can't go premium. I've said that the whole time because that's not going to fix our big problem. Mr. Chairman, there's a motion on the table. It's not been seconded. Um, I just would like the motion addressed. 
I agree with what you're saying, Craig. I do. I get it. I didn't understand. Sorry, I didn't understand that that was a motion. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed no. signify by saying no. 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 So we have two no's and two yeses. This county is going to have to think how to really fix this school system yeah. and do it the right way and get it all done instead of band-aiding everything. Mr. Chairman, can we take Mr. a break? Mr. Stevens, I assume that... Mr. Chairman, can we take a break? Yeah. We're in a five-minute break. <laughs> We're back in session. Okay. Next is... 7D on our printed agenda. That's the county manager and HR, uh, Miss Ray. Yes. Regarding um, the Phase One B market study, which we've already alluded to today. Sure. Your, your I'll kick us off. Um, we have affectionately called this Phase 1B. It is simply a follow-up to the Phase 1 market study, which was focused on detention, EMS, and social services. You'll recall that when we implemented the market study back in January, we spent roughly half of what we had budgeted. And so the board had asked us to come back with some additional recommendations to further advance the market study with the remaining funds. So that's what we are um, trying to cover with you this evening. And Cheryl Ray is our HR director. She has been uh, handling this study with Baker Tilly, our consultants, and she's going to walk us through some recommendations and next steps for further implementation. All right, good evening. Am I good, Bruce? Yep. Um, so yes, so um, January 1, well, I guess it was middle of January, you all approved um, our first phase um, implementation of the market study, and we did have some remaining funds, which we were asked to go back and work with these departments to see what other um, options and ideas we could bring back to you all um, to further move um, forward in the compensation retention strategies that we have. Um, so this has been a lot of conversation under the sheriff um, has left, but he has been at the table for many of these conversations. Um, focused mostly on detention, EMS, and social services. Um, we knew they were part of phase one. Um, we've worked with Candace Goble, which is our DSS director, as well as Ray Vipperman, our EMS director, um, analyzing um, just strategies. But before we could get there, we had a little bit of cleanup, and that's really not the right, wor right word, but we did have to do some housekeeping. Um, you'll remember we implemented a new pay scale. Um, this was the first time that we have adjusted our pay scale, not just adjusted by percentage, but we truly moved all of our positions to a new pay scale, which, mean they got that, which means they got assigned to a different um, structure with a, a minimum, a midpoint, and a maximum. Um, because of that, our sheriff's office actually has several positions, part of um, a board action in the past, that gave um, us the ability to hire sheriff's office employees at $5,000 more than the, the starting range. Um, so we needed to implement it, implement that into the pay scale to really be accurate in how we're portraying what we're hiring versus just saying, hey, we're hiring someone at $43,000, we're really hiring them at $48,000. Um, so that was one piece. Additionally, we um, needed to look at some compression issues our new pay scale created. Um, so for instance, investigators and um, corporals were at the same level, right? That, that doesn't make sense, but when you're looking at 900 positions or 400 job classifications, some of these things you don't see because it's just the see the trees, um, be able to see the trees in that, those aspects. So we were able to, once kind of the dust cleared, we're like, hey, this does not make sense. We need to go back and adjust some things or make some recommendations to adjust. Furthermore, 
Um, we know that we have our health department and our social services department, and those are all Office of State Personnel positions. Truly, they're county positions, but there is another governing personnel act that goes over their positions where we have to have pay equity amongst those two departments in affiliation with the state's regulations. So there's this relevancy piece. So positions have to all be scored within a relevancy of relationship. Um, that's different from what we do here internally. So the new pay scale did provide some challenges with that. So taking all those things in, that was first up what we needed to solve. And that's what we're bringing to you tonight with an adjustment um, of that first piece on the agenda um, for June 1, correcting it, would be um, for Sheriff Detention Center, would be 4,491. Um, and that does include fringe. Um, and then, of course, with our health and social services, that's 5,809.29. So that is just one month of adjustments, right? So if you take that amount times 12 months, that's the overall annual cost that's going to take for us to make those adjustments but we know we're only going to realize that June 1 forward for here and those are really necessary for us to be in compliance with OSHA but also being able to really present what we're doing um, for the sheriff's office and get some other pay um, grades aligned that will make us competitive internally so that's number one you all will probably remember red line and red circle. That became a very common vocabulary that most of our employees had never heard of before we um, went with Baker Tilly. Um, and so we um, certainly had a lot of education to do here, but we really needed to look and understand, are these positions truly red line? So just as a reminder, red line means, hey, we have a minimum of a salary. We're not gonna pay any less than this for this position. A midpoint where we've said, hey, it's six years, you should be at midpoint is what our goal is as we go forward. And then a maximum. We're not gonna pay anything over this maximum for this grade. Right, we we valued this position based off of job duties and skill set needed to be um, to be in this this range. So some employees were above the range. I want to say it was 51 employees. Their positions were above the range. So we needed to look at each of those positions. We have to remember we only went to the market for detention, social services, and um, EMS. So there's some other positions in there that we didn't get market um, data for, right? So we did have to look, we worked a little bit with Baker Tilly on a little bit of extra research, and we know some of those positions may be in phase two, but in looking at that, working with Baker Tilly, we've analyzed those positions, and we've also made some recommendations to move some positions um, up in their range or readjust. We would usually call that like a reclassification, right? You're reclassifying them to a different range. So with that, you'll see the sheriff's office. There's about 27 folks within sheriff. And when I say sheriff, I, I am always referring to detention center, ICE, SROs, and, of course, our deputies. So that's that whole um, Maple Street address. That would be a cost of $32,545.85. And that is going to be retroed back um, to January 1. And so you may say, that was my recommendation. That's when we did for everyone else in the county. So I think, you know, to be fair and equitable, we'll retro these folks back to January 1. And so there would be a little bit of retro pay because now they will not be considered redlined and they would be able to have um, their ability to get that compression, which is a, a half percentage per year up to six years is what we did with Baker Tilly. Additionally, with other departments, there were 24 other departments that we looked at, um, the, uh, 24 other individuals and in other departments that we looked at, and that cost was 9,131.34. So truly that cost overall to realize is 20,838.60. Of course, on an annualization, that's 41,677. So that does move our budget, right? That, those dollars will be realized and be incorporated. Um, we did also create a red line policy that we did upload that we're just looking um, for your, um, your um, attention to it. Um, it will be a new process for us as we go forward, July 1 forward, where we look at merit pay, we look at other pay that we may get, and we're no longer going to add pay to people's salaries to continue to push them over the maximum. They basically would stop at maximum and they would get maybe a merit cash payout. That would be a percentage realized at the end of the physical year or other ways. And those are all out of recommendations of what Baker Tilly recommended, but also other counties in North Carolina are doing that as well. Okay. Um, additionally, um, that was, that's pretty much what we had for um, cleanup. 
these conversations that we have with the sheriff's office, detention, um, EMS, and um, also CECOM, right, because they're a public safety position as well, um, is holiday pay. And I know this came up at a meeting where um, we talked about, you know, these positions that have rotating schedules where they work 24-hour shifts or 12-hour shifts, they may work holidays, they may be scheduled off that day. Because they're full-time employees in these roles, they automatically get the holiday time that we give to all employees, which is 12 hours, and it automatically gets banked into their holiday bank time. They're also earning accruals, right? They're earning vacation and sick and other time off accruals that we all earn, fair and consistent. These holiday bank time um, banks have continued to grow because Staffing is low, or staffing is low, um, vacancies are high, so these individuals are not able to take off the time as they would desire, um, but then they have this, these dollars sitting aside that they see as value, right? So they came to, to us and said, hey, listen, we would like the ability, I think the sheriff's idea was, this was his idea originally, um, the ability to allow us to pay out this time. Other counties do do this as well, so hey, you have a pot of money that we are liable to pay out when they leave the organization, just like comp time. We're liable to pay that out to them. There's not something like you lose, you don't use it, you lose it. No, it's definitely compensable time. So the idea was, hey, could we once a, once a year or twice a year look at these banks and pay out this time, pay out this time as a benefit of employment with Alamance County as a way to say thank you. So originally we looked and we set, we looked at June and December or two times to play it out, right? Um, but then we started thinking, how are we gonna fund this throughout a year? How do we ask the commissioners for more money mid-year? Does that really make sense? So in working with these departments, which is, which is a huge portion of our employee base that represent these departments, the policy came out to say, hey, we would like to pay it out in June, which is the policy has been uploaded to, um, to this agenda piece pay it out in June, and only if that department had lap salary to cover it. So right now, we know this first year, if approved, would be the largest year that we pay out, right? We've never done this before, so we've, we've certainly have a lot of time allocated there. We also know that not all employees would love this opportunity, right? They may have a vacation plan down the road that they wanna save this time for. So we really did craft the policy where we took that in mind. Um, and so we um, ultimately would let that be the employee's option to either pay it out or move it to vacation time because in our organization, vacation time as of December 31st, if you have more than 240 hours, that will roll to your sick leave, which in a local government setting, sick leave is very important because every 20 days of sick leave you have is a month towards retirement, so you can retire earlier, right? So these are all benefits of employment here. So with that policy, the total compensation was $422,103. Um, $422, um, and so you'll see that broken out on the agenda packet with the Sheriff's Detention Center, EMS, and CECOM. Again, I think I said earlier, um, Susan has checked. All of these departments do have the lap salary to cover this. If you guys do approve this policy enactment tonight, it would be in place in June. We would work with the departments to communicate it, and then we would pull this payout from lap salary from this year's budget. And then going forward, this is how we would do it every June. We would look. Yes. Question. Mm -hmm. These are accruing as a liability, right? Correct. So rather than taking it out of lap salaries, why not reduce the liability? So they are not true liabilities that we have to book into our system. Uh, they are payable in that fiscal year. So until an employee is pulling those hours down, it's not a true liability that we are having to account within the general fund. Now it's represented on our government-wide statements, but we are not have physically. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, right. It, it, we are it, somewhere we're recognizing it as right. a liability in a in the governmental wide, but it is not a true liability that I am booking into our system. It's kind of semantics, isn't it? It's in a different fund, but yes. Because even like vacation time, you she does something similar with vacation and comp time. Right. They all have to be coded. So they are liabilities, right? If people, these all left, we would be required to pay this time out. Um, however, um, we're not, I guess we're not legally ought, um, have required to report all of those and carry that liability in that full amount. In the general fund, that's correct. 
we looked at this policy as a benefit for employment, right? Not right. all counties do this. This would differentiate our organization. Um, I will say, you know, from when we originally spoke about it, I think the sheriff spoke about it maybe in February. We worked, we crafted policies back and forth. We had originally mentioned April was a time that we would maybe target for that. We didn't come back to you guys because we were still working out those things, but a lot of our employees heard the April date. April came around for payroll, and we got lots of phone calls like, hey, didn't you guys aren't you paying out our time so people are very much interested in this um, this policy if we can enact it but completely up to you all I'll continue moving forward um, is you know so you probably see you know that we're saying we're paying out of lap salary so you're like well Cheryl you really didn't use the rest of the money that we um, allocated so we have crunched numbers we actually had the share um, we actually had EMS they presented um, it was over 600,000 of what to do and be able to move their time, um, move their pay up to be more competitive. And really that um, I-4085 corridor competing with Orange County and Guilford County, and we've already spoke about how our market study really looked at comparative counties. It did include them, but it did not just include them. Um, our DSS also presented, um, I think that was 450,000. So um, the amounts are just so large to be able to bring back with what we have remaining. Um, we did look through and said, hey, if we were to target paramedics, just as an example, um, and pay them for experience, right? So we'd look at the first six years they had, if they had experience to come here, we would give them a percentage. We crunched several different numbers. One thing was, you know, for 44 paramedics, just full-time paramedics, that was $166,000. Um, and so just moving through all of that, we realized it wasn't enough money for us to do something meaningful, um, and we would disappoint more than we would um, really make people happy, right? And so we, we don't want to do that because we know going forward we have phase two that will be starting in August um, with an implementation in January. We know that we'll focus on some of our other positions that we have um, we have concerns and vacancies with. Um, so that was the recommendation not to move forward with any other increases. Um, and that and that really did come from these department heads as well of you know targeting one position or two, the compression issues those create and just the overall um, employee morale. Um, that was not the desire to do that. Is there anything else we wanted to talk about? No, I think we just need some direction on each of these pieces in terms of moving forward. So we have the realignment of the pay plan for the sheriff health and social services that needs some approval. Um, we also have the red line positions. If you want to approve all of these in one, we can do that or take them separately, whatever you prefer. What is your recommendation? My recommendation is to move forward with all of these. I think I'll make a motion that we approve all of them as one motion. I'll second. Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions. So we budgeted in this year about what eight hundred fifty thousand dollars to eight hundred eighty nine. I think the amount that to, was imp to implement uh, the results of a pay study for a number of departments. For three specific departments. We got the market study back. We allocated about half. Correct. Which was also applicable to others in the organization. To everybody, there are all other departments in the organization as well. The other departments were not benchmarked, but we were able to do some adjustments for um, to adjust for some compression and to recognize uh, tenure and longevity. Okay. So this is basically much of the other half. Of what what we, what we budgeted in the in the mark for the market study. Correct. And this impacts which positions? Well, there's a couple of different components here. Uh, this is going to address some of the issues with the sheriff's uh, detention employees, um, DSS and health. The red line positions are across all across the of the organization. Okay. Yeah, with a large concentration in the sheriff's office. The holiday payout is going to address EMS, sheriff, detention, and CECOM, because those are the ones who are working and not able to take those holidays. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. So the vast majority of the, of the folks affected with this are the original groups 
that we identified as wanting to analyze in the first study? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Thompson. I'm good. We just need to, we said we was going to do this, we need to do it. Yeah. Mr. Carter. That's what I said. And I'm in <laughs> total agreement. Yeah, you know, we've already set aside the money. It's uh, already tagged. We cannot spend it. Will they take it now or take it when they retire? So I'd say let's pay out. We've got the money. Uh, let's do it. Have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? You can have Can a, I ask one quick question, sort of related sure. but different? Do we know exactly how many vacancies we have? In these three yep. yes. departments, but specifically detention, yes, EMS, and social work. Yes. So, so I know Heidi will have some um, a little bit of this in her budget presentation, um, but we do. So we have, you know, and this is an ebb and flow situation every day, right? We hired we hired two people yesterday, but we may separate one tomorrow, right? Um, so vacancies at DSS um, were thirty five vacancies. Well, social work. Social, I'm 17 social workers. Okay. So 35 overall, 17 social workers. Um, and that's a fairly lower number than we have seen in a while. I know 2021, it was about 60. Yes, so, yeah. so yeah. those numbers Good look, mistrust. those numbers are doing good. Candace's team is doing really well. Um, but I don't know that the social workers number 17. has changed, has changed uh, Yeah. I think we, we've had success in other areas. You might be right. Economic, yeah. uh, I can't remember the like term. economic services yes. and income maintenance. Yes. So what I can tell you is um, I don't think we track the information at that level. So we'd have to go back and data mine in our Tyler Muniz technology. But just in the last, you know, I do definitely keep Heidi abreast because those are things that we're looking at. Just in the last, I would say, six, eight weeks, they are hiring more social workers, social worker IANTs. Um, these folks are coming in. They don't have a lot of experience coming in. So that's a little bit alarming, right? We're not able to get that experience to join our team. Um, but they are making great strides in those roles. So we could probably go back and look at just vacancy year over year so to see where we are on those positions. 17 social workers. How about EMS? So EMS, we are 11 EMS positions, and seven of those are paramedics. Mm -hmm. Again, race team is making great strides. They just had three paramedics, just or three um, base um, basic paramedics, just passed their para, uh, three basic EMTs yeah. passed their paramedic certification just last week. Um, some of those are part time with our organization, right? They want to get through summer, join the team full time. Um, but we um, we certainly do have seven paramedic um, positions open right now, with some people in the queue um, that are moving through that process for hire. And then 47 detention um, positions, which 14 of those are I. Um, positions, which some of those roles were created um, originally when we adopted the ICE program, and we've really never filled those roles. But still, 47 detention, I will say that's probably higher than what we've seen in a while. Those are platoon people, I mean, people who are on, For the most part, yeah. You um, might have some corporal, a uh, couple corporals. I'm looking at Mantry Stotts, and she's their personnel manager. Um, yeah, so. But a ton of those are detention officer positions. You said 14, 47 and 14? Yeah, 47 detention overall, and then 14 are ICE, which are detention officers. But really, those have stayed pretty vacant for right. several years. Um, but of that 47 total, um, a few of those are administration or like corporal sergeants, as, um, as Ms. Therese has shared. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, the next item is 7E, and that's the county manager. Do we need a stretch break? I have things to pass out if you'd like to stand up for a moment, as I would. Bring in some cots. <laughs> I hope not. Hopefully they're good for you. All right. All right, commissioners, I know I'm standing between you and uh, adjournment of the meeting soon thereafter, 
But this is one of the most important things that you do as a commissioner and certainly one of the most important roles I have as a manager, and that is to present to you a recommended budget for your upcoming fiscal year. It's my pleasure to present your fiscal year 24-25 manager's recommended budget. Here's your strategic plan page that you're quite familiar with. It has a mission and a vision on it, hard to see. But honestly, we have found ourselves in a very critical juncture with this budget, with our mission being compromised because we're struggling to effectively provide high quality services for our citizens and community members. We're grappling with significant revenue challenges. At the time of your Board of Commissioners retreat earlier this calendar year, we honed in on a theme of rebuilding our foundation. We talked about needing to make significant investments in infrastructure, in our community, and in our employees. But as we worked through this budget process together as a team, we realized that we needed to pivot on our theme and reconsider that and become more about fortifying a foundation and less about rebuilding. Our service costs and our cost escalations have outpaced our revenue growth. As stewards of Alamance County, we're tasked with prioritizing and supporting initiatives that fortify the pillars of your strategic plan. And it's our hope that doing that this year will leave us in a position to begin rebuilding in future years, but this was not a budget that we could rebuild with. We zeroed in on some board priorities also during the retreat and they helped guide your recommended budget. We're gonna concentrate our fortification efforts then on several key areas. The first, conservative revenue and expenditure management. This budget reflects a very comprehensive understanding of the economic landscape that we're working with. It analyzes our trends that are impacting your fiscal year. And we did a real drilling down into the details of the line item requests. We're also utilizing a five-year financial forecasting model. We've tackled some big challenges in this budget, such as the end of COVID funding, fluctuations in your sales tax revenues, and contract escalations while remaining dedicated to responsible fiscal management. Secondly, a priority for the board has been supporting the workforce. We've recognized the importance of our workforce. We aim to attract and retain top talent by prioritizing competitive compensation like you just did in the previous item. And we're making targeted efforts to continue to support our workforce in this next fiscal year. We're addressing community needs. As you heard from the sheriff, we're a growing community and our services must evolve to meet the community's needs. Public safety continues to remain a top priority and we're committing, committed to meeting the mental health challenges within our community with our new behavioral health center scheduled to officially open this June. Cooperative efforts are underway between the sheriff's office, the court system, and our behavioral health providers. And this will enable us to fully leverage your opioid settlement funding and provide additional access to crisis services. Finally, we're prioritizing capital and facility needs. School and county owned facilities are aging. They're requiring significant up, upkeep and upgrades. Renovations and repairs have taken a backseat to service provision during the COVID-19 pandemic, but now are at the forefront of our needs in order to keep our children, our staff, our community safe and in an environment that's conducive to growth and learning. Your current tax rate is 0.432 cents in your fiscal year 23 adopted budget. Next year, your proposed tax rate is proposed at 0.452 cents. An additional two cents is needed to cover for some inflationary cost increases and to make up for some revenue losses. <coughs> Many of you has, have asked me, what will this two cents do for us? This will allow us to continue to operate and maintain services rather than make service cuts and reduce services to the public. 
the impact of a proposed two cent tax increase on a median home price. The median home for Alamance County right now is $263,997. A tax, excuse me, a tax rate of 0.452 would equate to $52.80 per year on a tax bill. <coughs> Your collection rate is recommended to stay <laughs> consistent with current year at 99.11%. Hard to beat that. We're, we're really um, doing well with that, and that's a testament to our employees and their efforts. And then finally, one penny next year will generate uh, $2,575,793 in tax revenue. This is slightly up from your current year, but not significantly. These two additional pennies can easily be explained with what we found ourselves facing right out of the gate. The statewide mandated increase in retirement costs, along with the impacts of that on the fringe benefits, equates to $2,833,372 over a penny. But I didn't do a fraction of a penny in that graphic. Also, we had inflationary increases in our contracts in our utilities for energy, and in our supplies. When I added all those up, the inflationary increase came to $2,340,495. There's your two pennies on the tax rate without any expansion of services. I know this graph is a little bit hard to read, so let me orient you to it. It's a historical view of tax rates beginning from 2001 up to the proposed rate for fiscal year uh, 24 or 25. And what's interesting about this is that you can see most of the time when we've decreased the tax rate, we've had to go back up. I insert these arrows here to show you that your current proposed tax rate is about at the similar level of the rate of 2001. Our services don't cost the same. We're trying to provide more, but our tax rate is an equivalent of the same time period. Similar to what you heard from the sheriff, this is a graph showing the projection in the growth of population. Between 2000 and 2022, there's an increase of almost 50,000 people, but we're nearly at the same tax rate. We're one of the fastest growing counties in the state, and yet we're also one of the lowest tax rates. And finally, this is similar to what you saw last year. This is for the tax rates for fiscal years 23, 24. So your current tax rate is showing there 0.432 cents. Alamance County is in the middle red alone in the red regional area for the lowest tax rate. Even with the proposed tax rate at 0.452, Alamance would still be the lowest of all of our surrounding regional counties. One other thing that differentiates Alamance from some of these other counties I wanted to mention is that we have a heavy reliance on our property tax revenue, where some of our neighbors might have the quarter cent sales tax, they might have a school tax, they might have a solid waste tax. So we're very limited in our revenue source and we're relying on that property tax more so than other counties. Plus, we don't have the, I don't, didn't hear you say it, but we don't have the quarter percent local option sales tax. Correct. Yeah, I did mention that, but you're right. We don't, and some of these do. So overview um, from the general fund, your next year's recommended amount is $220.5 This represents a 2.8% increase over fiscal year 23-24. All funds are uh, 260.3 million, representing a 2.5% increase. And you'll note that the consumer price index for the Southeast region for the past 12 months, which is the inflationary measure that we use, is coming in at 3.3. So the growth in your budget is not exceeding inflation. It's in fact not even keeping up with the cost of inflation. Here's our revenue graph that we like to show you <clears throat> where the money is coming from. You can see that over half of your revenues are coming from property taxes at 53.3 cents. 
followed by sales and other taxes at 22.3, state and federal funds at 12.6, fees and licenses at 6.2, and finally other at 5.7. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but here's a list of um, your major revenue sources. And I will call your attention to your sales tax, the third bullet down. We're estimating a drop in that of about $3.3 million. That's having a significant impact on your revenue sources next year. Next, I want to talk about fund balance. We are projecting uh, a budgeted amount next year to offset your operating costs of $8.4 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're continuing to rely on these rainy day funds that should be limited to one-time uses to balance your budget. Your appropriated fund balance next year would be $7.4 million, which is up $1.2 million from your current year. Your designated fund balance is dropping. It's dropping because we've already depleted that in balancing your 23-24 budget, so it's not available for us to um, budget for next year. So with this reliance on fund balance, we are estimating that your unassigned fund balance level will dip below your internal policy of 20%. Can I slow you down a second? Yes, sir. The preceding slide, uh -huh. uh, real estate transfer taxes. So you're predicting that there's going to be very little transfer of property. We are seeing a trend representing a dip in those revenues next year, yes. What I'm seeing out there is there's just not a lot of inventory in the market, so That's sales true. are extremely slow right now. And interest rates have gone up tremendously. Interest rates up, prices up. Um, we saw house just go on the market today that everybody in here will be familiar with. But uh, Yeah, do you have a question about that? Mr. George, does that sales tax dip include an assessment of Medicaid hold harmless payments? Yes, it does. So in the I past, that, that payment's been around $3.3, $3.4 million. So if you, t if you discount that, basically sales tax is even. I mean, it's still showing down. a lack of revenue. It's, it's, it's still source. declining, yes. Yeah. And we can give you a sales tax, a sales tax comparison What's at your work money? session. Okay. Yeah. So with a trillion dollars in credit card debt as of January 1, and um, everybody's probably maxed out, what they are buying is not as much, and it's overpriced anyway. It, that she's broke. <laughs> yes. I think where I'm seeing what I what I think I'm seeing, uh, I haven't heard anybody verify this, but if I look at the marketplace right now, inflation is hitting everybody kind of hard. They're buying necessities, not buying non-essential items. So if you're buying necessities of food, mm -hmm. gas for your car, your sales tax is lower on groceries than it is on non-essentials. So we're seeing a negative impact on our sales tax revenue because of the effect on the economy from inflation. And a lot of it's being bought on plastic. Even then, people are buying their groceries but on plastic. But you can go to That's California right. and you oh, can God. steal $900 worth and not get arrested. So Oh, that's right. Isn't that crazy? <clears throat> All right, back the on... is... We'll have Bucky's coming in a couple of years, and we'll yes. have people coming in here spending money, and our sales tax revenue will go up. Well, yes. the groceries, they sell groceries and gas, so. And, and they sell a lot of other stuff, too. Yeah. All right. Back on the fund balance, I wanted to point out the last bullet on the slide. Your unassigned fund balance with what is being proposed is likely to dip below the 20% threshold that is your internal policy. We're projecting that could go down to 17.9. So this is not a revenue source you can continue to tap as we adjust this budget. One more slide on fund balance. This graph depicts your next year's amount, how much greater it is um, trying to offset inflationary increases and reduce revenues um, with this one-time 
revenue source. All right, on the expenditure graphic, still the largest portion of your budget is being made in the category of education funding at 26.7%. Uh, followed by public safety at 25.2, human services, 19.8, and then we have general government, debt service, and other making up the remainder. Our slide on supporting the county workforce. Um, we've talked about ways to continue to help our employees feel valued and to continue to, to press upon them the importance that they have for us. We're recommending that we continue the merit pay program with no change from what you have in your current year. That will add an additional $55,000 for a total cost of, ju of just over a million dollars. We're recommending that you continue the market compensation study phase two. We just talked about that. Um, I budgeted 400,000, so that is actually a reduction from your current year budget of 489,000. We've mentioned the investigator stipends. This is for our sheriff's officers right now. Um, this, there's not a separation between the deputy patrol and investigator positions. So we would recommend adding $140,000 for that pay stipend. And then finally recommending, uh, continue to recommend an annual cost of living adjustment for employees. Uh, you'll recall in the current fiscal year, you um, gave a 4% cost of living adjustment. We're recommending a 3% next year. So that is actually a reduction of $719,000 in cost. The total cost of the COLA would be $1.5 million. This graphic here is showing um, the cost of living adjustment. We base that on the... Um, the consumer price index for the southeast region so this is just a graphic showing it from 2021 to 2024 for april it's currently at 3.3 percent and we're recommending a three percent cost of living adjustment we found it interesting that the federal government is this year providing a 3.2 percent cost of living adjustment for social security and other benefits and we'd like for Alamance County to continue to make these adjustments as a proactive way to help uh, reduce the need for large compensations adjustments when you get behind and you don't keep these up, it becomes painful <laughs> to come up with a large amount of money to make up for those years that you don't continue to make this. I think we've heard a lot about that tonight. Yeah, yeah. We are seeing some improvement in county vacancy rates. So if you'll look all the way on the right side of the screen, that's our countywide percentage. And I'm showing the yellow bar for fiscal year 22-23, the blue bar for fiscal year 23-24 as of April 30th. So countywide last year at this time, we were at 16%. We're currently at 14%. And I'm seeing some improvements. I put green check marks over the three departments that were featured in phase one of the market study. So for detention, we went from 28 to 27. That's a small uh, dip there. Uh, EMS, 14 to 13. And then social services, 23 to 17. Like your current year, as a spending reduction and a cost savings measure, based on our historical vacancy trends, we're not budgeting for all the vacant positions that we have in detention, DSS, or EMS. That creates large lap salary, pots of money, and so we are taking those funds. And if we come to a point where we have a lot of increased hiring activity, we would need to come back to get some of those positions funded. But those vacant positions will remain. But typically, we don't have these field positions anyway. That's correct. The historical data is not shown to have every position filled in those three departments. So we think it's unlikely that will happen next fiscal year. So we're not trying. To, we are not tying up funds for vacant yeah. positions in those departments. Okay. Here's a sampling of some of the inflationary impacts that we've seen in this budget. Um, we're continuing to face high operating 
or increased operating costs for high inflation, as most other counties are. And in order to provide services at the current level, we are trying to do a thorough review of all of our contracts. We're going to take that on this summer between the budgeting and finance departments to make sure that our contracts are competitive and that we're able to manage some of these cost escalations moving forward. Cost reductions. So we received requests this year um, that were substantial. And I, from the requested amount, I have cut $19.8 million from what has been requested. This was not an easy feat. This took a lot of analysis to get down to the levels that we're recommending. We received requests for 35 and a half new full-time positions. And unfortunately, I was not able to fund any new positions that would have um, been funded out of your general fund. The only new positions in next year's budget are those that have funding outside of your general fund, so they're not impacting your tax rate in any way. One of those is a dental clinic foreign language interpreter. This is being paid out of charges for services with the revenue that's generated in the dental clinic. And the other two positions you'd already approved during our discussion of opioid settlement funds. One is a behavioral health peer support specialist and the other is a recovery court coordinator. Again, no impact on your general fund. We received requests for 26 new vehicles and I am only recommending from general fund one ambulance replacement that you've got to keep pace with. It takes us over a year from the time we place an order to actually get a new ambulance. And the second is an ambulance remount. That will cost 500000 for those two. Also included are some equipment purchases for the landfill. Again, not coming out of your general fund. Those are paid out of the landfill fund, a separate enterprise fund. And then I do have 16 sheriff vehicles uh, recommended, although not coming out of your general fund. We would recommend that we would place this within the capital improvement plan and add this to the financing the uh, installment financing that we discussed because I simply couldn't come up with the revenues to purchase those outright. Um, I've asked you this before. What are all the sheriff's cars in the courthouse parking lot? Are they old or are they driven or are they going? I mean, what is that? There's a lot of them. I don't know what they are. I'm just curious why they're there. I'm not sure exactly what all of those are other than we have a policy in place when they reach a, thir a certain threshold mm -hmm. mileage we look at a replacement okay. and not adding on to the fleet right so the vehicles that we're talking about uh, purchasing or, or borrowing funds to purchase would be replacement uh, not adding to the fleet but i'd be happy to follow up with the sheriff and, and get an answer for you back okay. at one of our work sessions i'm just curious because i've just seen them over there in the parking lot there are meeting. a lot of those yes okay moving on to education so the elements burlington school system um, submitted their budget request to us late and we pulled the general statute to understand exactly what this meant. I will say that I received a Google link with some PowerPoint slides that was emailed to me at 5.04 p.m. Friday, May 17th. You'll see that the yellow section highlighted says that the Board of Education is to submit their entire budget, not later than May 15th. And then I want to highlight the last uh, sentence of this because this was eye-opening for us. At the time of the submission of the budget, the Board of Education shall also submit to the Board of County Commissioners in writing the academic performance of the schools, including school performance grades of each schools, any schools identified as low performing or continually low performing, and efforts by the local Board of Education to improve those identified schools' performance. I'm not sure that we're meeting the requirements of the general statutes in regards to the school budget submission. Given that we did not receive a timely request until well after the recommended budget was already sent for printing, I recommended level funding in this budget as anything else would have been presumptive. Any increase that the board would like to make then for current expense funding 
will require additional revenue through a property tax increase. The capital funding um, is recommended at 3.9 million, which is an increase of 600,000. And this chart is just showing the total sources of funding and what's going uh, to the schools in the recommended budget in total, approximately $69 million. I'll also mention that the combined level for current expense funding uh, based on the per pupil numbers that we're seeing in their average daily allotment, they are expecting to see a decrease of approximately 541 students. So the current expense funding um, would increase the per pupil amount because the per pupil numbers are going down. So that would go up by $40.91. Your per pupil amount then would be $1,942 per student. Do we know what the per capita rate is for state funding for ABSS? Um, I have seen in the Association of County Commissioners data a per capita funding for tax rate, but I'm not sure I've seen that for schools, but I'd be happy to dig into that and try to get that back to us. All right, for Alamance Community College, uh, the total recommended current expense and capital is recommended at 5413822 We did receive a significant uh, increase request of about 42% for them. I have recommended approximately half of that request, a 21% increase, increasing their funding by 848000 and we funded or recommending funding their capital at the full um, requested amount. And here's their chart for total funding of approximately $10 million, uh, $10,140,699. So our next steps, commissioners, I need you to confirm some dates with me for um, budgetary work sessions. We're uh, talking now about having a work session ahead of your June 3rd public hearing. So we are um, tentatively looking at May 30th in this room at 10 o'clock. We understand that there's an OSC meeting, but all of the folks that attend that meeting, we would like to invite here to have that focus of that work session be on education partners. So May 30th for that. And then two, that would occur after your public hearing. So we are looking at June 10th and June 12th, both at 10 a.m. in this room. If those work for you, we can get the word out that and, and notices out and invite those who need to be in attendance. I have a conflict as I think I've told you on the 12th, but. Okay. I didn't remember that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm available that afternoon, but that morning I'm, I'll have to check on that one. Okay. Do you want us to adjust the time on the 12th or do you want to adjust your schedule? Well, for me, anything after 1 o'clock would work perfect. Would you like to make the June 12th one at 2 o'clock then? That's fine. Okay. That work for you, John. Yes. Greg. All right. I'll follow up and make sure that we're clear I think so. I think so. on those. Uh, for additional information for members of the public, there'll be copies of the proposed budget available on the county's website. I did want to take a moment to thank staff that put a lot of time and effort into putting this budget together. Miss Rebecca Crawford, our budget director, budget and management services director, and her team is here, Jessica Moody, Anna Bolin, and Alex Norwood is watching from home. Um, Susan Evans, of course, our finance director, and Cheryl Ray, HR director, and again, my management team, Sherry, Bruce, and Brian, couldn't do this without you all. We are all looking forward to working with you commissioners in this important process moving towards an adopted budget. Thank you. We're assuming that these meetings will be approximately two hours. Is that what you've allotted? Might also announce that any and all those meetings will be broadcast um, and available later for viewing. Um, so it's May 30, 10 a.m., June 10, 10 a.m., 
and June 12, 2 p.m. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I might point out that we may have acquired th three or four young fans today who may be watching us on TV. I don't know if that's the way you want to use your TV time, but be real informative. Maybe a little boring, but real informative. Let me also state my appreciation for your being here, each and every one of you. Uh, as you gain a little more age, I expect you guys to be attending meetings regularly and volunteering for boards where we make appointments and can put you to work. Which school do you attend or? Yeah, the virtual school. Universal. Universal. Thank you. Virtual? Yeah. Virtual. Yeah. Okay, county attorney's report. Nothing for me tonight, board. Thank you. Best speech so far. <laughs> oh, Vern. <laughs> County manager. Nothing further from me, board. Thank you. County commissioners. Mr. Turner, I'll start on the end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have anything to say at this time. Mr. Carter. Hmm. I want to point out something that I learned last <laughs> week. There were some recent uh, occurrences down at UNC where they required backup and put out a call to surrounding law enforcement agencies. Our Alamance County Sheriff's Office sent our search team, and that's uh, some agencies would call that SWAT and our Bearcat down there. And I was told by a pretty good source that when our team rolled in, the uh, um, folks in Chapel Hill law enforcement gave them a big hooray and they welcomed it because they knew Alamance County came not to play, to get the job done. So, got a good team. We've got to be out here and support them. They support us and protect us. Same through for education. And the chancellor verified the American flag which stay aloft would not be brought down mm -hmm. and replaced. And one of the fraternities, I don't know the fraternity's name. I Kappa Phi. Thank you. Uh, deserve a lot of credit for not allowing the American flag to hit the ground. Amen to that. Yeah. So I don't, I don't say a lot of positive about UNC Chapel Hill very often, but this is what... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, guys, when you pick schools, look at not only what you're going to learn, but the values of the uh, university, the academy, whatever's at stake, because your future depends upon it. They've already picked East Carolina purple, so I don't think we have to worry <laughs> about anything else. <laughs> uh, well, I went to Elon undergrad and Wake Forest Law School. So either of those are positive choices. Uh, I like personally, if I was going to school today, I'd be looking at liberty. <laughs> Mr. Turner, any comments? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turner. Um, yeah, I, I just want to, I want to thank some people that of something that's happened and then I've got something else I need to say. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to North Graham Elementary to their art show, book fair, and school drama play about the solar system by the third grade class, and it was amazing. When I came in front of the school, I noticed the garden area in the traffic circle. It was all grown up with weeds. That is the first impression of the school, although many times what is inside doesn't match what is outside, but appearance is a big deal. The landscaping of the schools used to really bother me when I was on the Board of Education, and quite frankly, it still does. When I left North Graham, I made a decision to fix it. I got permission from the principal to see if I could get volunteers to pretty it up. I posted what I wanted to do on Facebook. It only took three days to get people to help. I want to thank the amazing people that volunteered with me to fix up the garden area at the front of the school. 
Boy Scout Troop Number 44 Leader Courtney Bailey, along with adult leaders David Reynolds and Dawn Shayer, and her amazing scouts Chase, Xavier, Christian, and Mays. Retired Burlington Police Officer Doug Murphy, who owns Murphy Pressure Washing. Brian Hurdle of Uncle Cuz Land Services, and Caleb Massey of Askew Peterson Monuments. These folks didn't think twice about giving of their self and of their times. I just really want to thank them. It looks amazing, and it needs to stay that way for the people that go to and serve at North Graham Elementary School because they're worth it. I, I spoke to a teacher today, a friend of mine, my best friend. She's retired, and she, when I talked to her, she said, you are feeling exactly like I did the last two years I was teaching. She said she was overwhelmed. She, she stayed upset a lot, and it was really affecting her health. So I'm going to tell you this because... After school reopened, following the mold nightmare, I went to every school. It took me three days to get across this county just to check on them. I still know a lot of the same people when I was on the Board of Ed, and many times they can feel like they're on an island all by themselves. Patsy Simpson, Tony Rose, and I used to visit the schools all the time when we would get calls from teachers, and it did not sit well with central office, but we really didn't care. I have seen dirty, and I have seen slack from cleaning companies, the ones that are paid millions of dollars. I have seen the wrong type of paint used, and it would peel right off, and I see the bad outcomes of that to this day. At a visit after mold, I was at a school where bugs were literally waxed into the floor due to the floor not being swept. Chairs were pushed into the corner and waxed around them, but not moved back to wax when the chairs were, and you could see the obvious difference in the floor. I reported it. That is a custodial issue. I saw the hot mess at Graham when it flooded once again. I saw the places where it flooded at Western High. Mud, muck came underneath the door where the outside drain was completely covered. I saw the Eastern EC teacher squeegeeing the water in his room, big electric fans running, and his entire EC class of students crammed into another classroom due to drainage problems from the big wall outside of the classroom. The big wall. Let me take you back to Graham High School. I was there two weeks ago where that big wall around the school has the doors open that are locked, that are not locked because security has yet to be put in place. The theory of the walls was due to many school shootings at that time, and this was a serious safety measure. But it is not a safety measure until those metal doors are closed by a security system. Don't for a second think that a school shooting cannot happen here. Then at the back of Graham High, the pothole festival, I'll call, I saw massive potholes with water standing under parked cars and the gates being hit by construction vehicles still not repaired, the athletic field building. In July 2019, when on the Board of Ed, I complained about the mess it was. I have pictures. It got fixed September 2019, and guess what? I saw it two weeks ago, and the ceiling is once again falling in. Why? And now Cummins. When Dr. Benson and <coughs> Simpson and I went over there at the request of a teacher, and we walked through the school due to the roof leaks constantly flooding the school. Ceiling tiles were replaced, sheet rock was replaced, some walls were repainted, but the roof still leaked, so there's your mold. And then there was Broadview and other schools, another mess. The picture I have of schools over these years would break your heart. They should. We had the bad paint job prior to mold at Cummins. Then mold from the school, then mold, and now I have new pictures. I have recently complained about the no baseball field and the sprinkler system not working for many, many years. And then now the bleachers at Cummins. Inside the room still have not been finished post mold at Cummins. The paint is still embarrassing at Graham High also. The conditions of the walls, open ceiling areas, on and on. I don't know why we think it is okay for children and their teachers to work and attempt to learn in this kind of environment. We don't do it. And you wonder why teachers are leaving. You wonder why military recruitments are the lowest they've ever been. And you wonder why juvenile crime is out of sight. And you wonder why we keep wondering why. It is all because of priorities and leadership. When $27 million was used to pay the mold removal, the mold that had been growing for years, it crashed and broke ABSS. So what are we gonna do? No more blame, no more tug of war, no more power struggles. And ABSS, I am not picking on you because I am standing by the teachers and the children that deserve the best education in the safest of buildings that this great country has to offer. We are at the crossroads of our lives with our schools and we have got to get this right, all of us. We have got to do better by our children and certainly better by our teachers. And parents, you gotta get more involved. 
crime, drugs, vaping, unsafe abusive homes, mental illness, suicide. I'm talking about our children. A third grader tells their teacher to shut the F up. A six-year-old in another county takes a gun to school and shoots their teacher. Two teens murdered in Mebane on the Orange County side by another teen. Name it. And we wonder why kids act the way they do. Because they act the way we do. Because we are the example and they are becoming us. Doing the same thing the same way will always get you the very same thing. If you're not moving forward, you're not moving anywhere but where you already are. And that is nowhere. You know, I voted against that bond tonight because I'm tired of Band-Aids. I'm tired of Band-Aids. I gave my word that I would not go past $150 million. It's a no-win situation. But until we get really real about what the needs of our school system are, our buildings and our teachers and our kids, we're going to keep coming up here voting, 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 voting. That's all we do is vote. I don't want to keep voting. I want to see examples. I want to see our buildings fixed. I want everybody that comes to this, this county to want to go see Alamance County School Systems. I am for private. I am for charter. I am for Montessori. I am for public big time because that is what this country is good for, is their schools. And I want every child to go where they feel safe, where they are learned. I want every teacher to be proud to walk in their classroom and not look up and see pipes, not see walls not finished, not see just crap in the corners, not see bugs waxed into a floor. That is, I am calling out the custodians. You make $5 million, and that is unacceptable for you to treat our schools that way. You don't go into school and tell the principal what you're not going to do. You sign that contract and you clean that school as though it's your own home because children deserve that. They deserve examples, and teachers deserve a clean place. I can't imagine walking to a school and seeing some of the things they see and really get really get pumped up about wanting to teach and learn kids. I, I just can't imagine. When I was back at Graham High School and the person took me back there, he was absolutely furious. He said, why do we deserve this? And the field hut, huh, I sent Heidi pictures and I'm thinking, 2019, fixed 2019, 2024, looks the very same thing. I'm told they have squirrels in the attic. Why do they have squirrels in the attic? Why do we have things like that? Why do we keep asking why? And I know I'm like a broke record, and I'm becoming to think I'm a broke record, but I'm so over this being the same thing. All we ever talk about is what we need to do to our schools. What we need to do at our schools is do it. We need to do it, and we need to get busy, and we need to make a difference for our children. Because when I look at the crime rates, and I look at what's going on with juvenile crime, and they will have to lower the age back down because they gave two years for juveniles, serious, hard criminal juveniles, to do even worse. They have to learn the hard way, don't they? We're going to learn, too, about a lot of other things we keep wanting to pass because we can make money off of it. Just wait. So, you know, I, I am all about, the, my daughter's a teacher, and I don't hear her talk about like this in Randolph County, and I don't want to hear other teachers have to talk about this in Alamance County. We are better than this. But until we think we're better than this, we're not going to ever be better. So that's it. Two things. One, these materials, please get them to Bill Ashley uh, in your proposed budget. And then call, I would request you call him, set up a time to meet with him on the budget. Uh, my second comment is I'm making a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Do second. I have a second? You All got a favor second. signify by saying aye. 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 We are happy here. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com. TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. 
Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.